Good morning, all, and welcome to the 2023 Soybean Industry Meeting uh, uh, Virtual Edition. Um, we have a wonderful lineup of speakers. Um, I'm your host, Dennis Lang, a little bit froggy this morning, but uh, trying to get over this cold. Um, but we're going to kind of pop right into it here. And uh, so um, we're going to start off here this morning just with our, our first topic, uh, weed issues in soybeans. We have Kim Brown Livingston, our provincial weed specialist with Manitoba Agriculture. Um, Kim is going to be uh, doing a talk on uh, herbicide resistance. And uh, I'm going to switch over to uh, a different screen here for a second here. And it might be a Michael Black for a second because I need to uh, flip, uh, flip screens here. So give me one second and we'll get going here. Already, so I'm going to turn my stop video off. Um, all of it, just one other quick announcement here. Um, you will be muted, and uh, towards the end of the presentation, when the questions are uh, are, uh, are available, um, I'm, I'll be able to unmute individuals who would like to speak. So you can just answer, throw a question in the Q and A section, and uh, we'll be able to uh, uh, answer that for you. So, so. I'm just going to stop my video here, and uh, then we're going to turn it over to Kim. And Kim, uh, take it away. Dennis, you're not quite in full screen mode yet. Oh, hang on. It's not clicking here. Sorry. There we just go. Well, Dennis, so thanks very much, Dennis, for having me on your meeting today. And Dennis is actually going to be working my slides for me. I'm having a bit of computer issues. And so um, Dennis has uh, got my presentation on his computer and uh, he's going to advance that for me. So thank you guys for your patience while we're doing this. So today I know we wanted to talk about weed issues in um, in soybeans. And really, I want to talk about herbicide resistant weeds. That's really the biggest thing that's coming at us. Um, in particular, I talk a lot about water hemp and Palmer amaranth. Those are weeds that really aren't here yet, or they're here in very, very low amounts, but they're very terrible. They're very bad weeds everywhere else except Manitoba, pretty much. Um, and so, but we need to talk about kochia as well, because that's really becoming a problem. That's probably our, one of our top weeds, if not the top weed in the province right now. So if we can go next uh, slide, please. We have been talking about herbicide resistance for 20 and 30 years. And I remember being at University of Manitoba when they found the first herbicide resistant wild oats. I was going to school then, you know, it was one of those things that we couldn't believe it was actually happening. We'd heard, you know, it might happen. You know, I remember being there and, and being in the hallways when that work was being done. Basically, um, it's just, it's a natural process. It's, it's going to happen regardless. If you look there on the left-hand side of the screen, we just, there will be resistant individuals in a population of weeds. And there, there could be millions of weeds, depending on the population density, depending how dense your um, the weeds are in a particular field, how many of them there are per square foot, per square meter, per acre. You can have millions of plants per acre. And so it, the odds are that one in 100,000 or one in a million or one in 10 million depends on the weed species. They're just going to naturally be resistant. So over time, if we are spraying with our regular chemistry and those resistant individuals, if you look at the middle screen, they start to become, there's a few more of them because we're basically killing out all of the other ones. That's what happens. We kill all the ones we can kill, but the ones that are naturally resistant, we let them live. We're basically selecting for them. And it doesn't take very long for us to become into almost a fully resistant population there on the right hand side of the screen because we keep doing a really good job at killing the ones that the herbicides still work on and we're letting the ones that are naturally resistant we're letting them grow uh, complete their life cycle set seed and then there's that much more seed in the ground to grow again next year so that's basically how it starts and we're at that point where we're seeing a lot of resistant populations in a lot of our fields next slide please so globally, uh, cases of herbicide resistance, there's a really good website, um, the Herbicide Resistant Action Committee, we get a lot of the data off that, and that's kind of the repository for worldwide information on herbicide resistance. And Canada has the dubious honor of being basically number three, three in the world, we're behind um, Australia and the US for the number of weeds resistant weed species and the amount of resistant weeds we have on the acres that we're growing. And since the 1990s, we've been, um, it's been about two new herbicide uh, resistant cases per year. So a new biotype of a particular weed or a new weed altogether. Um, next slide, please. 
so again, when we look at this, we've been steadily increasing. If you look at that graph, that graph is going up, up, up. It's not changing. It's been a pretty steady increase since the 1970s. And right now in Canada, we've got about 80 species. And again, that's about two more species a year, every year since the 1990s. Next, please. So this is uh, um, the... Uh, this is um, the introduction time of new herbicide sites of action. So we call them herbicide sites of action, but we'll also call them herbicide groups. And within herbicide groups, we have herbicide families. I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit too. Um, but um, even if you hit the next slide, Dennis, um, it'll just show you there should be a line here. Basically since the 1980s, we have not had any new herbicide introductions. So the last herbicide group that came in um, I've lost is um, was group 13. That's clomazone. We that's the only one that we have in that group 13. That's clomazone or command, which is for cleavers and chickweed suppression in canola. And gr our group 27s are relatively recent. Also, our group twos are actually a relatively recent introduction. They came in in the early 1980s, um, and you know we have a surprising amount of resistance already. But we have not had a new herbicide group since the 1980s until group 28 which is that's great that came about in 2021 but that is a group of herbicides that is used in rice now there may be some applications there might be able to be some products in there that can cross over into some other crops but for right now there's nothing so we have not had anything new in a very long time so it'd be the same as you guys trying to farm um, or our farmers trying to farm with equipment from the 1980s um, that's basically what we're working with nothing has changed we get new herbicides within those groups. Um, so we get slight upgrades, but we're still working with the same herbicide groups that we've had since uh, the 1980s. Next slide, please. So what we do in, in, the, in the prairies is we actually have these prairies, uh, prairie-wide uh, weed surveys. So we do a couple of different surveys. We do abundance surveys, which was we, we go out and we count a lot of weeds in a lot of fields and just kind of get a really good idea of what kind of weeds are out there. And then we follow that up with the uh, herbicide-resistant weed survey. So we go back to some of those same fields and we actually gather the weed seeds in the fall right before harvest. And we gather the, the weed seeds and then those weed seeds are grown out and sprayed with various chemistries and then we decide, you know, to see what's resistant, what's not resistant. So the last full round of surveys um, was done from 2014 to 2017. Um, Saskatchewan usually starts the round of surveys and they do it over two years. They have about three times as much cropland as we do. So they do it over two years. They've just got too much to do in one year. And then we go next. And then after us is Alberta. So our last full round of surveys was 2014 to 2017. And at that time, Manitoba is, again, here we have the dubious honor of leading the pack. Uh, we found that 68% of the fields had some level of herbicide uh, resistant weeds in them. And when you scale that up, uh, that ends up, ends up looking about 23.7 million acres infested with herbicide resistant weeds at a cost uh, of $530 million annually to our farmers and to the industry. And again, that was the last round of full surveys. We're in the middle of another round and we fully expect those numbers are going up. Um, next slide, please. So when we look at the herbicide resistant weed species in the Canadian prairies, this is a slide from Charles Geddes. He's a, a researcher in Lethbridge, Alberta with Ag Canada. And when we look at, there's some group one inhibitors, which those are group one, those are ACCA's inhibitors. So that's our green foxtail, our wild oat, our yellow foxtail, that type of thing. Um, down there, right below that, we've got our group nines, which so far, that's the only thing, the only herbicide we have in group nine is Roundup or glyphosate. We just, I'll just talk about glyphosate. Um, and so that's kochia, downy brome, and water hemp. Um, in group two, though, that is a big group, uh, a, a lot of herbicide resistant weeds um, in group are resistant to group two. And, you know, like I said, that's a relatively recent addition to our herbicide modes of action. Uh, it hasn't been around for very long, but uh, herbicide resistance started developing very quickly to the group twos. And it's, you know, for sure, it's the group that we have the most weed species and, and a lot of um, a lot of weed species becoming resistant to that every year. So there's other um, other resistant weeds as well, uh, but we also have over there down in the corner in the bottom right hand corner in the purple, that's group 14 inhibitors and that's like we've got kochia and we also have wild oat resistant to group 14. So next slide please. So when I want to talk to people about herbicide resistant weeds in the West, the big ones I'm worried about are kochia, wild oats and downy brome, water hemp and palmer amaranth. So today we're just going to talk about mostly kochia, water hemp and a little bit about palmer. Um, also coming soon, Canada fleabane. We need to be in the lookout for this because we are talking soybeans and we are talking a weed that has got glyphosate resistance elsewhere in the world, just not here, um, which is a good thing. 
uh, but I've, we're getting reports of it kind of starting to get away on us. So I would not be surprised if we're starting to see some glyphosate resistant on that one. So I'll mention that one briefly, just because I want you guys to all be aware of it. But we're going to start talking about kosha um, on the next slide, please. Um, I guess what I guess what I'll first talk about is that we've recently started we're in the middle of another round of prairie wide weed surveys. So in 2022 Manitoba did our abundance survey as well as our resistance survey so you can see the sites there we ended up uh, surveying with uh, we ended up uh, with 704 sites that were complete and with good data and you can kind of see they're done by eco district and within that eco district it's done by uh, cropping and crop density within that eco district. So some eco districts like the arm of McDonald had a a lot of sites because it is pretty much fully cropped to annual crops you know border to border there um, and whereas other eco districts would have maybe slightly less or rms within different eco districts would have slightly less cropping intensity so slightly less amount of surveys so you can see the survey sites um, next site slide please and so at the end of the day, this is our first poster. Sorry, that's coming in a bit blurry, but that's just, I've got a PDF of this. If anybody wants this, I can send this out. This is our first go round um, of data. And this is basically province-wide data. Now we will be distilling this down amongst the areas, amongst the crops. There'll be a lot more data come out of this, but the preliminary data showed um, the top 20 weed species there in the middle. Again, it's, it looks like it's a bit blurry, um, but um, the uh, we, what we did find this summer was that there was a, the biggest percentage of weed weed free quadrants, which meant we actually had a lot of places in the field we were counting that didn't have any weeds. We had a lot of fields that were very, very clean. And I think with the late start, some of our some of our crops that got started really late had uh, had a really good start. And they got up and going really quickly because it was late, it was warm, there was ample moisture. And uh, they really shaded out the weeds and there were some really nice clean fields. So that was good to see this year. I've highlighted in yellow, and again, that's gonna be hard to see, uh, but that's kosha. That's the only, um, that's really what I'm talking about today. It has moved up in the weed survey since the last survey, but it bounces around quite a bit. And kosher really has been on the rise in the last few years. We're coming off a drought, uh, droughts, a few drought seasons in a row. For some people, it was up to three years in a row. And anytime we have, we're in a drought situation, our, we see our salinity acres increase, our, our saline areas on the fields increase. And so coupled, uh, increased salinity coupled with poor crop growth in that area, it's like a double whammy. And you'll end up seeing a lot more kosher in that area. You don't have the crop competition and kosher just does well in those saltier soils. So we did see kosher rise quite a bit. Um, it, I think it's sitting at number 12 and that had moved up quite a bit from the last survey, but it does bounce around a little bit over time, but it definitely has moved up since the seventies as well when late seventies, when we started doing these surveys. So next slide, please. So I, when we finish our abundance survey, we do that one in July, and then we come back at harvest and we do herbicide herbicide resistant weeds. So in this case, we do roughly a quarter of them. Now, normally we we did uh, we did actually some extra fields this year. We did choose to do um, sunflowers and field peas and um, and dry beans um, in addition to the normal normal top six crops that we always do. So we do have uh, more samples than normal uh, because we chose to do extra fields just to get a baseline for weed for data on those fields. Those are fields that uh, those are crops that don't normally have enough acres to justify doing a survey on because we don't get enough of a good sample. We don't get enough uh, fields to get a good sample. Uh, or uh, 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 so we chose to do those just so we have some data. But normally we're doing um, we're we're doing uh, canola, which is our number one crop, followed by all the wheat and then soybeans, and then after that we do uh, we do oats, we do barley, and we do field corn. So those were the top six crops by acreage that are surveyed. Plus again we did some extra. So we go back into those top six crops and we sample 157 fields again we come back we take the weed seeds they're being grown out right now and and as they are growing they're being sprayed and we're hoping to have some results on that um, fairly soon but we will have results out by within a year usually so again we did 157 fields we ended up with 622 different weeds and 44 different weed species on those fields uh, next slide please so we also do a post-harvest weed survey of kosher and also Russian thistle. Not so much the Russian thistle in Manitoba. We do have some of it down in the southwest corner, uh, but uh, this is a survey that is actually a post-harvest survey. So the last one in, was done in Manitoba in 2018. And at that point, we found that we had 58% uh, glyphosate resistant and 1% dicamba resistant kosher. If you look at the graph or the picture, sorry, on the left-hand side, you can see the red dots are basically all where the glyphosate resistant kosher is. And it's a little hard 
hard to see, but there is some blue and some green dots, and that is the um, that is the, the dicamba resistant, and also the, the the populations that are both dicamba and and glyphosate resistant. But again, this is 2018. This is five years ago now. When we look on the right hand side of the screen and we look at resistance frequency, we find down there, and the, especially all across southern Manitoba and particularly in the southwest, we are at 100% glyphosate resistance. When you're so basically all of the samples from there were coming back at as glyphosate resistant. So I'll show you what's happening in the other provinces and the progression of glyphosate resistance in kosha and, and, and group four resistance as well. So our next slide, please. This is um, the, uh, uh, I think it's the Alberta slides that should be coming up next. Yeah, we're just having, it's not advancing here. Oh. Hang on a sec. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. There we go. Okay, yeah, so this is Alberta. And actually, Dennis, if you just uh, advance till we get to the full slide on, because there's some animation in here. So the 2012 survey, again, we do these surveys every few years. Um, and so in Alberta in 2012, when it talks about 100% ALSR, that's group two resistance. And we know we've got group two resistant um, kosha we've had for years, we've had for a dozen years already. At that time in 2012, it was 4% glyphosate resistant. If you look in the middle there at the 2017 survey, again, 100% group two. Um, after that, uh, 50, at that time, 50% glyphosate resistant, also starting to see dicamba resistant and fluoroxapure resistance as well. So that was starting to show up in 2017. We were at 18% dicamba, 13% fluorox. And by 2021, again, we're assuming it's all group two. We don't even test for that anymore because we know it's all group two resistant. We don't even bother. But now we've moved to 78% glyphosate resistant, also 28% dicamba resistant and 44% fluoroxapur resistant. So you can see the progression from 2012 to 2021. So in nine years, you can see the progression there in Alberta. I'll show you next what's happening in Saskatchewan. Oh, sorry, one more slide on Alberta. Basically, if you look at the Venn diagram here, um, when we're talking about uh, herbicide resistant weeds, and you know, we talk about HR weeds, really, we're talking about MHR weeds, which is multiple herbicide resistant weeds. And when you look at that Venn diagram, um, you're looking at glyphosate and the cross resistance there between fluoroxapir and or dicamba. The one good thing, I guess, is that we're not seeing a lot of cross resistance between fluorox and dicamba itself. It's right now, it's kind of either or, uh, but both of those are growing. So we, at the end of the day, it's still a really, we're getting some really big numbers on the glyphosate resistant. Next slide is now we'll look at the Saskatchewan type of thing. Saskatchewan uh, data, they've got glyphosate resistant kosher. Their latest survey was in 2019 and basically they found 87% glyphosate resistant. And if you look at the pictures there on the right, and you can basically see when you're spraying, um, there's an awful lot of kochia that is not dying. Basically that's how it's done. The kochia, uh, the plants are grown out in flats in a greenhouse, they're all sprayed. And you can see just, you know, by the picture, there's an awful lot there that isn't dying at all. And the next slide, please. When we're looking at dicamba resistant in kosha uh, or dicamba resistant kosha in Saskatchewan, um, basically they were finding 45% dicamba resistance. So um, next slide, please. So we don't have a recent survey in Manitoba. Our next survey is a couple of years off. Whether or not we can move that up, I'm not sure, but we are a couple of years off from our next um, post-harvest uh, post kosha uh, survey, but we do, we have seen in the other two provinces, the numbers are climbing uh, very rapidly. So we would fully expect to be seeing that in Manitoba as well. Uh, one thing that we can see, what, when, one thing we can do in Manitoba is we have at the uh, PSI lab in Winnipeg, uh, which is the pest surveillance initiative lab in Winnipeg. It's run by the canola growers and you actually can get live on live plants. You don't have to wait till the end of the year. Um, and, the, and, and collect seed and then get it grown out and get it sprayed and then get your answer back. You can actually find out if you've got resistant kochia in your field right now. So you need live plants and they need to arrive in decent shape, um, in good shape, as good shape as possible to the lab. So as quickly as, as possible so that they're still in really good shape. And basically they're looking for um, numbers of copies of the gene that is supposed to break down glyphosate. So what happens with glyphosate resistant kochia, um, it's called uh, target site amplification. There is a, a site that glyphosate should work on and should kill the plant. What the plant does, what the kochia does in this case, is it just makes a whole bunch more copies of that gene. So no matter how much glyphosate you throw at it, there's still enough of that gene. It kind of just, uh, there's just not enough glyphosate to, to work 
to, to, to kill that plant. So when we, what they are doing with this test, you'll get a result back like this. In the green bar there, it'll say glyphosate susceptible. So if you have less than two copies of that gene, um, then you'll be, um, then that, then that plant would still be considered susceptible to glyphosate. If you have more than three copies, then you are seeing target site amplification and you are going to start seeing some level of resistance. Uh, the PSI lab has had plants that were in with more than 100 copies of the gene. So that is very, very high level of resistance. And the way it works with kochia is that you'll start off with low levels and very quickly you'll get to high levels. The plant just keeps making more copies of this gene and, and, so you will see when you start to see glyphosate resistance in fields, you will see some will die and you'll see some will be completely green and not, not, not dead at all. And then you'll see everything in the middle. Some will be yellowed up, some will be stunted, some might die eventually, some grow out of it because it depends on how many copies of this gene they have. But eventually they end up with a lot of copies and it's like completely resistant. Um, next slide, please. So we also have, unfortunately now, uh, PPO, which is group 14 resistant kochia. These are some samples out of Saskatchewan, I believe. And if you just hit the next slide again, Dennis, um, what's uh, in the red bar there, that's your basically normal rate saflufenacil, that's your heat brands. And so this is in grams active per hectare, but that's your normal, that's within the, the normal uh, uh, label rates. And you can see that there are some populations that heat is still working very well on, but that last population at the back there, it is not working uh, very well at all. And even at very high rates of saflufenacil are not even touching that. So that's something uh, that's coming up on the radar. Our next slide, please. Um, North Dakota, um, they are actually testing now. Um, they're, they've got greenhouse studies going on right now and they're looking at group 14 resistance. They are finding that they, are have, that they have group 14 resistance to saflufenacil, which is our heat brands, uh, carfentrazone, which is AIM. They're finding sensitivity, which means it's still working, but it maybe not as good as it used to, to sulfentrazone, which is authority, and flumioxazone, uh, which is Valterra. Now, the, and, it, and it, this is very dependent on populations. Some populations are worse than others for resistance and some it, it's really um, population by population of kochia. They're doing further testing on all of the group 14s because we do have some newer group 14s that have come out and they're doing further testing on those just to see where we're sitting at with the group 14s. And because it's a very diverse group. And the next slide I'll show you um, the next couple of slides, we'll just talk about the group 14s. So this is the, um, the HRAC um, uh, herbicide mode of action classification. Our group 14s, I'm not sure if you can see them, Dennis, but they're over there on the left-hand side of the screen. There's a, a fairly diverse group and you can see uh, just down a bit, um, down one more, uh, right and to the left, just over. Sorry, I'm trying to use my pointer, but my pointer's not working. Anyways, uh, we'll go. We'll just move on to the next slide. Uh, the group 14s are a really diverse group, and so within the group 14, which is a chemical group or a site of action or mode of action, we actually have chemical families. So that's um, underneath this group 14, we have all of these different families, and within the group 14s, lots of times um, there's like one family. Um, per product. So we look at something like uh, flumioxazin, um, that's an N-phenyl phthal thalamide, thalamide, and uh, that's our Chateau or our Valterra, but that's also in our Fierce, which we're using, and Ipco bifecta, which has metribuzin in it. Um, when we look at pyroflufin, which is Blackhawk, that's just a burn-off product, that's a phenyl pyrazole. Um, when we look at saflufenacil and the new tiafenacil, which is in sight from Gowan, that's a burn-off, those are burn-offs. And then we go down to the triazolinones, which is something like carfentrazone and sulfentrazone, which is AIM and authority. And it's interesting because um, there's, these are very, very different, the group 14s, even within the same chemical family, um, carfentrazone AIM is a burn-off product and we are seeing widespread resistance to that, uh, kosher resistance to that in, in, this, in uh, North Dakota, whereas Authority uh, is actually a product that works on weeds as they emerge from seed. So completely different, uh, total other end of the spectrum. Those are both the same chemical family and we are seeing Authority working still quite well in most cases. Um, that is something that they're investigating, but, um, but they are seeing, so again, so you can't always, uh, we, they're, they're, the group 14s are hard to predict exactly which ones are going to work and which ones aren't going to work. Um, the trifluti, which is a new one, it's a triazolone, and that's a new one that's in Viraxor and Viraxor Complete. Uh, so, you know, we'll see where that one shakes out. But we do have some new, newer group 14s. But again, that group has been around for quite a long time. And there's a lot of diversity within that group. Uh, next slide, please. 
So I, I'm only going to talk about the downy brome once, um, just because it is our first case of glyphosate resistant grass in Western Canada. Um, that's significant because it's a grass. So far, all of our glyphosate resistant weeds have been broadleaf weeds. And elsewhere in the world, there are a lot of glyphosate resistant grasses. There is a glyphosate resistant wild oat in Australia. It is a different biotype than what we have here in Western Manito in Western Canada, but it is still a wild oat. There is also an Italian ryegrass resistant uh, to glyphosate in Eastern Ontario, but we don't have that species here in the prairies, so we're not as worried about that. If you hit the next slide, please, Glenn, uh, Dennis. Uh, these are the normal rates. That's a half a that's a half a liter to a liter rate of glyphosate, and you can see the downy brome population in the back. It did not kill it at all. And it took some pretty high rates to start seeing glyphosate do any damage to that to that downy brome population. So normally, again, I said I wasn't going to talk at all about resistant wild oats. Uh, right now, our, res our wild oats are resistant to group one, group two, group three. Uh, we're not a uh, group, uh, group eight. Uh, we do not have any glyphosate resistant wild oats. And in a crop like soybeans, that's great because if we had wild oats, our glyphosate treatments are going to take those out for now. And this is just something to keep on the radar because we are, uh, you know, we know it's approaching. So next slide, please. Now we're going to talk about water hemp. And under our Noxious Weeds Act, uh, water hemp, palmer, and smooth pigweed are tier one noxious weeds. So tier one noxious weeds in Manitoba under the Noxious Weeds Act must be eradicated. There are no exceptions. Enforcement is at the municipal level through the weeds inspector or a weed supervisor, depends on whether they've appointed somebody or whether they have formed a weed district and they have a board and then they actually hire somebody to be a weed supervisor. It doesn't matter. That it doesn't matter what the title is, but that there is supposed to be a person at the RM level that enforces the Noxious Weeds Act. One of the things though, most of our other tier, most of our tier one weeds, other than these water hemps, other than these amaranth species, um, they are really what I call ditch weeds. I've got quotation marks around that. And, and these are weeds that would threaten, I mean, they're very serious. They can threaten, um, uh, our, they threaten our pastures, our hayland, our ditches, our, our ro you know, they can get into our wildlife management areas. I mean, that is very serious. But this is new territory because this is the first time we've got a weed here that can threaten basically all of Agro Manitoba. Um, basically, all acres of cropland are at risk of becoming infested with water hemp and palmer and possibly smooth pigweed as well. We do have smooth pigweed in the province. It has not become we have not had a problem with it at all that I've that I've seen but elsewhere in the world it is glyphosate resistant so that is why it is on our, our as a tier one weed with the water hemp and the palmer so again tier one amaranth species will threaten all cropland in Manitoba and um, I'm going to talk about some others some some crops in particular but uh, this is so this is new territory for 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 all of us um, this is a weed that uh, you know again this is this is pretty frightening uh, next slide please so this was our first find last year. That is our six foot long boardroom table in Carmen. And that's my guide to crop protection down there for scale. So you can see the size of this weed. This was in a glyphosate resistant soybean crop uh, that had been sprayed twice with one liter of glyphosate, nothing else. There are uh, lots of people still doing that because up until recently it has been working, but that is not working in a lot of cases anymore. And we should not be ever putting glyphosate down alone. It's got to have a tank mix partner in it. And we've got to be using other chemistries as well in, in addition to glyphosate. You can see there um, the seed heads on water hemp. They're long and snaky, very different looking than a red root pigweed. It does look like a red root pigweed just on steroids until you start looking at the inflorescence or the seed heads here. And again, you can see they're long and snaky and skinny and kind of droopy. Um, looks very different than a red root pigweed at, at this stage. And it's also about eight feet tall. So yeah, this ain't no red root pigweed. Uh, next slide, please. I've got some more pictures here of some of the things we saw this summer. The one on the left is out of a, the edge of a drainage ditch and that had been sprayed apparently with Roundup to keep it black. And then a lot of the weeds had come back and especially this one is huge. Um, so this is one, um, the one in the middle there, uh, we found that one that was on the edge of a soybean field near uh, Lac de Bonnie. 
And so the farmer thought that, you know, it was right on the edge of the field and he felt that he hung the boom over enough that it probably had been sprayed with glyphosate and the upper right hand corner there, that's that same plant in the middle, you can just see for scale, that's how big these things are. Um, that's my hand in the picture there. And so when we're pulling these things out, we're taking these away where we don't want these things to set seed. So we're digging them up, you can't pull that up. I'm not, I'm not strong enough to pull that up. So those ones you dig out and you got to make sure you get all the root pieces as well because the roots will break off and they will regrow and set seed because that's what pigweeds do. Uh, next slide, please. So this is my, my last set of pictures. So there on the uh, on the left hand side of the screen, that's me later on in the year. We're in September now. You can see by the soybeans, they're quite died down. Um, they're so an earlier, earlier version of, or earlier variety, sorry. And uh, I don't know if you can see, but I uh, when I go into these fields, um, I string uh, black garbage bags, big black garbage bags through my belt loops and anything I find I bag. We try not to knock the dirt off the bottom of those plants because you might knock some seed loose while you're doing that. So you just bag it and take it off the field and get it out of there. This particular field we were in, um, the farmer had um, this pig, this water hemp had gotten away on him. It had been there for several years and um, he hadn't really noticed it until this year. And by the time we got in there, he was pulling truckloads of water hemp off that field. He and his family were out picking and they were just driving up and down the fields, picking and picking and picking, trying to get it off the field. But it's obviously going to be there for a while. So actually on the way back from one of our visits up to um, up to the Lactobani and Beaujager area, uh, we actually saw this one. Dennis was with me at this point. Um, that's who was taking the pictures, actually. And so in the upper middle pictures there, there you can see, um, you know, we spot this thing and on a 60 mile an hour drive by. I know what that is because I've seen that enough over the last couple of years. So we go in and we investigate. We're in a soybean field again, um, you know, definitely not as mature as some other soybean fields. But when you pull that plant out of there and uh, you take a look at it. I think that picture actually was from about a week earlier, but when we went back to actually pull that plant out, that's me there on the uh, on the bottom left, on the bottom right hand side. And that is a monster of a plant with most of the branches. Some of them had broken off, but we did manage to get that one off the field. We just found one, but definitely further into the field, definitely in the field. And, uh, you know, hopefully there's not any more of those, but those are the type of things that we start to see. And that is, uh, you know, a fairly big plant. Next slide, please. So this is my last find and, and maybe my scariest, I think, of the year. I found this one on a 60 mile an hour drive by heading out of Treehern on highway number two. I, you know, it was this one was in September, end of September. And, you know, the soybeans had died down by now. They're at this point, they're basically just sticks with pods on them. And you can really see that weed, the one that's on the left hand side, that weed sticks out. There's something there. I went to go get that. I had my bags. I bagged that one. But as I was walking into that field, I saw all the plants there in the picture on the right hand side. And they were definitely, they're not as big. The one was bigger, but it really wasn't that big of a plant until you really got up and looked at it. Uh, but there was a lot of really small ones. These aren't red root pigweeds. We think there's some type of strain, some type of hybrid between a red root pigweed and a water hemp. And those are things that I would have never noticed from on a drive by. I would have never, if I was uh, on a combine, I would have never probably even noticed that or not thought anything of it. The weed on the left there, you'd see that and you would hope that you wouldn't put that through a combine. You would, um, in the left-hand picture, pictures, right, that's one plant and that's, that's a huge plant. You're going to notice that no matter what, especially again, when we get into combining our soybeans, there's not much left of them. They're just sticks with pods on them. You'll definitely see that. But some of these other skinnier ones, there was not a lot of leaf material left on these by now. They were hard to see. And uh, they would be, that would be definitely, a, they, those are, have, have a lot of potential for being spread through a field. I would hope when you see a plant like the, in the picture on the left, you would stop the combine and not put that through a combine. Uh, but that needs to start happening. We need to start talking about uh, weed seed, harvest weed seed management a lot more. So uh, next slide, that's it for pictures. Uh, this is just a map of North Dakota. This is basically everywhere where they found water hemp in, the, in, in their state. And it's basically all, it's moved east as well now, but basically it's our entire Manitoba border. Next slide, please. 
in 2019. This is our map, so it was first found and confirmed by DNA in 2019. There actually is a report in 2017 that one plant was found in the arm of Taché, but we've only got mapped the ones that have been DNA confirmed. So in 2019, there was some infestations found in some of these areas. If you go to the next slide, we've got 2021. There was no weed specialist here in 2020. So in 2021, these are the maps from 2021. We see basically on the left-hand side is water hemp. Basically we found some plants in the same RMs as, as before and added another couple RMs on top of that. And uh, when we look at the right-hand side of the screen, we found our first Palmer uh, infestation. They had, there was two plants found in a dry bean field, uh, one male, one female. And, um, and uh, there was no seed. Luckily, they were caught early enough. Uh, in a dry bean field, there, it's very noticeable. A 10-foot tall weed is very noticeable in a dry bean field. So um, a good sharp-eyed agronomist saw it and pulled them out, dug them out, actually. And um, the history on that field was it had been in millet. And with millet seed is a known um, is known to be contaminated with Palmer amaranth in the States. This was millet, that act millet seed that actually had been imported from Colorado, I believe. And so we feel that's probably the route of access that the Palmer came to that field from uh, in that instance. If we go to 2022, uh, we see on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, sorry, it's probably a bit laggy there. On the left-hand side of the screen, it's, um, it's, it's very red, much more red, many more municipalities. We are moving west, we are moving north. Uh, it's moving everywhere. Um, just because a municipality is white doesn't mean it's not there. It probably means that we just haven't found it there yet because we didn't, we weren't out looking for it. Um, on the right hand side of the screen, we did find another Palmer. Again, same farmer, different field, but again, a history of it being of that farm having millet on those fields and that millet seed had come from the States. So that is something to watch for on that farm and in that area. And I mean, these are big noticeable weeds. We see them very, very nicely in soybeans and in dry beans, uh, really hard to see them in corn and sunflowers. We know, I'm sure there's some in the corn and sunflower fields, we just can't see them. Um, they're just so tall. I mean, how are you going to go in and scout for weeds in corn and sunflowers um, later on in the year? You just can't see the weeds. So one thing to note too, we have had a population show up, a few plants show up over in Dauphin, the water hemp there on the left hand side of the screen, our water hemp has been showing up in Dauphin. Uh, same farmer, different fields, we're not sure route of entry on that one, it's showing up in Clearfield canola fields, obviously when you're growing Clearfield canola, it, once you go get to your in crop sprays, you're just using Aries and uh, this is group two resistant weed, this was a group two resistant weed so um, that wasn't working so there was just a few plants there they've been handpicked every year, but there's they've got on that farm somehow not really sure how but we are watching and I think he's going to be moving away from Clearfield canola on that farm. And um, down there on the Saskatchewan border in Ellis Archie, there was one plant found in a Roundup Ready soybean field, or sorry, Roundup Ready canola field, sprayed twice with Roundup with glyphosate. And uh, the farmer actually was out swathing and he'd noticed this very tall weed. It was over six feet tall. He thought it was something he should be concerned about. He was right. It was water hemp and um, it was obviously resistant to glyphosate. So we are finding these scattered plants throughout the province and we are finding, again, um, the map is just getting redder and redder. So next slide is just the progression from 2019 to 2021 to 2022. You can see the amount of the water hemp distribution in Manitoba is increasing uh, every year. Next slide, please. So we also, there's a Canada-wide harmonized surveillance of common water hemp because elsewhere in Canada, it's a problem. If you look in the middle of that map there, you can kind of see uh, Manitoba is the red dots off to the left and the red dots off to the right and center is uh, Saskatchewan, or sorry, uh, Ontario and Quebec. So they have uh, a lot of issues, especially in Ontario with water hemp. They, um, they have he really, uh, a problem with a lot of infestation in a lot of fields there. Um, they've been dealing with it. They found their first glyphosate resistant water hemp in 2014. And they are at the point now that they have, um, you know, um, many, many, many acres infested. They have five way resistance um, of, of water hemp. They have moved from glyphosate resistance being found in 2014 to by 2021, um, multiple fields with five way chemical resistance. Uh, I don't have time to talk about that today, um, but those are, you know, we've been talking about that at our winter meetings. And if anybody has any, info, has any questions, you can ask me about that. So we are monitoring this Canada wide. Luckily, we don't have enough in Manitoba to be surveying. Not one water hemp plant showed up on our abundance survey when we surveyed 700 fields um, thank God it should not have showed up anyways if, if it we're it's it's a tier one weed it's not supposed to be here at all 
when we find it, we eradicate it. Um, I am not surprised that it didn't show up. I would have been, uh, it would have been terrifying if it had started showing up in the survey. If it starts showing up in our weed surveys, we have a real problem. Um, next slide, please. So when water hemp shows up, the initial testing results for Manitoba show that it's coming preloaded with resistance. It's already resistant to group two and group nine, group nine and group 14, or a combination of two and nine and 14. It does not appear to be a problem in competitive crops like wheat and canola. The exception in canola would be Clearfield or Roundup Ready. Um, if you're going to grow those crops, you need to be looking at uh, something up front like an edge uh, that has residual that, that's going to take out some of those other weeds because you're in crop herbicides are not going to work. There's nothing else you can throw in a Clearfield or a Roundup Ready canola for a post spray. You can, there's nothing, there's nothing that will work on a resistant uh, water hemp. It is a serious problem in corn, dry beans, sunflowers, and soybeans. Um, these are row crops generally. We can grow soybeans on a narrow row. Dry beans are also grown in some cases on narrow rows, but when you're looking at corn and sunflowers, and a lot of our soybeans are grown on wide rows, um, it's just there's no competition there for a long time until that row crop closes in. Um, so we need to do herbicide layering. We have to be using products with residual, our pre-products, not just our burn off, but our products that have residual um, to uh, take those weeds out early because that crop is not competitive in, a, in that row crop situation. Um, in some cases, your herbicide options are limited um, or non-existent. Um, there's just nothing that can be used um, for in-crop once you get to in-crop because of the resistance in this weed. Next slide, please. So just I'll, I'll just quickly flip through some slides and then I'm at the end. Um, just Manitoba acres of sunflowers and corn. <clears throat> um, we're basically running at last year we had a big drop in corn acres with the late seeding. But you know we've been running at the between 450. I mean we're probably averaging out somewhere just shy of 500,000 acres. So we have a half a million acres of corn. Not a lot of sunflowers either. Um, uh, you know just uh, probably under 80,000 acres every year. But we are um, you know these are uh, economically important crops and these are crops that are really vulnerable to water. When we look at our next slide, we're looking at our, our um, soybean acres. I mean, this is what we're talking about here today is soybeans. Um, Dennis is predicting, I think, 1.2 million acres uh, for next year. We've always been, we, you know, we've been sitting around that. Uh, we've um, over a million acres anyways, if we're looking at the average over the last couple of years um, since we've still climbed. But we've got, you know, if we're looking at 1.2 million acres next year of soybeans, this is a crop that is really vulnerable to water hemp infestation. Next slide, please. Now peas, a smaller acreage crop, but, and not really very vulnerable early on in its life stage, but anybody that has peas in the rotation, we need to really be watching that at the end of its life cycle. This is a crop that comes off very early, unless you have malt barley on the farm, this is the first thing that the combine hits. And, you know, we are combining this thing in August. There's an awful lot of season left after, um, depends what you're doing with tillage, depends what you're doing with herbicides, but you have an awful lot of season in there for water hemp for any pigweed, but especially water hemp to grow and set seed. So that's something that we're going to have to be watching. Not so much in crop with peas because it's a very early growing crop. It's very competitive. I would not be worried about water hemp at all in crop <clears throat> unless it's a very poor pea crop. Um, but it's after we harvest that we really need to be concerned. And our next slide is just on dry beans and just talking about edible bean acres. Very vulnerable crop. And again, um, row crop usually, but can be done on narrow rows, very limited herbicide options, really vulnerable to infestation. So when we add up all of those crops together, when we're looking at corn and sunflowers and all the dry beans and soybeans and, and peas, we're looking at about 2 million acres. Summers are, you know, the, the number's gonna move around a bit, but you're looking at 20% um, uh, of our crops in Manitoba are really vulnerable. Basically all of our crops are vulnerable, but 20% of our crops are capable of, of this, where this weed can flourish and spread and set seed and just become a really, really huge problem. So that's one in five fields we have to be really, really careful with. Uh, next slide, please. So basically Canada fleabane, I'm just gonna go through this really quickly because I'm almost out of time. And um, it's a winter annual or a summer annual in Ontario. They first found group nine resistance. Again, that's our glyphosate in 2010. Now they have group two resistance as well. It's a really difficult weed to get out of there. Uh, this is a weed that's doing, it does really well in no-till and zero-till situations because the seed can germinate from the surface. It does not need to be buried at all. In fact, it does better if it's not buried. Um, and I've been hearing lots of reports of this really showing up in our um, 
our uh, forage seed fields in the interlake. Really starting to see this in the last couple of years, and that's frightening because that's new. In North Dakota, there are biotypes in North Dakota now. This has been a bad weed for many, many years. There are biotypes that are two, three, six, and eight. Now, group eight is now group 15, so our Avidex is actually now, um, uh, and anything, an Eptam, and anything that was an eight is now a group 15. So that's something to watch for for resistance management. But our two, three, six, eight, nine, 14, 15, and 27, they're either resistant or tolerant. So this is a weed that had some natural tolerance anyways. A lot of the chemical groups didn't work great on it to start with, um, but we either have full-blown resistance or we've got a natural tolerance to many, many herbicide groups. So this is an issue. Um, so just to be wa watch for that, I've just got a few pictures in the next slide. Um, basically, it can be either really rounded looking like the upper right hand side of the picture, like the leaves, are, it's because it'll almost always start off as a rosette. And sometimes the leaves are quite rounded, but they do have these little little notches in that upper third of the leaf. You can see those, uh, you can really see that in that picture where they're kind of round. To me, this looks like a hairy stinkweed at this point. Um, the picture on the left, um, this is a hairy weed. It almost looks like a kochia, but it has these little notches on the leaves. You can see them a little bit in that picture. This leaf is not nearly as rounded. It's much more pointy tipped, um, but it's looking like a, like a kochia. starts off kind of looking like a kochia, not quite as hairy as a kochia, um, but kochia doesn't have those jaggedy edges on the leaf uh, on the leaf edges and then it and then it will bolt and it will be very tall and skinny and then uh, all of the inflorescence is at the top and it's just like a lot of tiny tiny little white dandelion seeds and this is what um, it looks like in a soybean field in Ontario I believe is where that picture is from and it can absolutely infest um, these the, it's it's a, just a carpet of Canada fleabane it's a real problem in some areas so just be on the lookout for that I have had two reports in this year one from Elm Creek and one from the Deloraine area um, that the farmers felt they'd sprayed it with glyphosate and it didn't die uh, so we'll be investigating those and again just something to watch so next slide please so weed control in the future, new herbicides, nothing. There's no silver bullet coming. I mean, there might there might be, maybe, but for today, there's nothing. And if you talk to any of the major herbicide companies that are doing discovery, which means they're putting, you know, they're, they're looking for new herbicides, there's nothing in the pipeline. So what we have is what we got. We have to make what we have last as good as it can, <clears throat> as long as it can. So when, when we're talking herbicide resistance, it's not if, it's when and how bad and which ones and not not one herbicide resistance but multiple herbicide resistance where you will you could have a herbicide resistant wild oat and a herbicide resistant kochia and a water hemp all on the same field and how do we deal with those need to get back to the basics integrated weed management which is good competitive crops anything we can that is our number one tool for weed control is a good competitive crop the ultimate goal needs to be to reduce the amount of weeds that see an in crop spray the less that gets sprayed the less herb the less res the less there are that can overcome that and and become resistant and my last slide if you don't mind. Um, basically, it's going to be a lot more management. The easy button is done. It's broken. It's smashed. No more easy button anymore. Um, a lot of info um, is available through management of agriculture, through crop insurance, or industry webinars such as this one, all of our, our chem companies. But the relationship with the agronomist, the industry, and retail is crucial for planning this year and onward because it's going to get a lot more complicated. And to continue on with our provincial weed surveys. These are crucial for gathering data on weed trends and resistant weeds. And with that, I am pretty much just about out of time um, but uh, if you have any questions we can take them now or if there's time we can take them later yeah I'm just looking through the question uh, list here Kim there's nothing at the at present here but uh, um, if you had to give a, a recommendation for agronomists for next year on the some of the resistant weeds um, what would be your maybe takeaway home as far as what they should be looking for what they should be doing when they see something in the field so well, if you see something in the field, you should assume it's resistant. It might not be. There's lots of other reasons why we have weeds escape and there's lots of spray. It could be spray issues. It could be, you know, did you have the right spray? Did that spray work on that weed to start with? Is there a spray miss? Was it a nozzle? Lots of times if it's a fit, like if there's lines in a field or if there's um, patterns, um, uh, you know, geometrical patterns and that's a spray issue. Um, could be something with the sprayer, with the water, one boom, one nozzle, you know, lots and lots of things. At the end of the day, you need to eliminate all those other things. Um, once 
those are eliminated, you would need to look at herbicide resistance. There are a few places that you can um, send seed to to get it tested for herbicide resistance. There's more and more labs now doing DNA analysis, like what we're doing, what PSI is doing uh, for um, for a glyphosate resistant kochia. Um, we're doing all those that testing that's being done on the water hemp. That's all the DNA testing as well. So that's quick testing. Um, there's lots of testing. Now that picks up target site resistance. It doesn't pick up metabolic resistance, which we're seeing more and more of. Um, but it's still a good tool to be using. So I would urge you to get in touch with with me or with your agronomist, and they'll get you know we'll we'll work on this. We'll try to get that those those tested. There are labs that will do testing, um, and if not, then we would wait, try to wait and gather some seed and get that tested over the winter um, through the more traditional way. All right, thanks, Kim. Uh, we're going to move over to our next presenter now. <clears throat> Uh, we have Horace Bonner here, who's the Provincial Soybean Specialist from the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture and uh, Food and Rural Affairs. Uh, Horace has been involved with soybeans for many, many years. And I'll get Horace to uh, sl slide his presentation over and say a few words. Yes, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I, I consider it a privilege to be part of your your morning here. And uh, if you want to ever contact me, I've put up my information there at the bottom of the screen. Um, I, I've been the soybean specialist here in Ontario for over 21 years. And uh, it's always fascinating to see and hear what other people are going through. So I'll, I'll give you a little bit of the Ontario perspective and seven things that I think are important to maximize your yield potential in a given field. Now, obviously this list is not comprehensive. There are other things we could talk about. And, and you'll notice right away, I'm starting off with some pretty basic stuff, some pretty straightforward information, but it's still important to, to get these things right, to really be able to pull in what we've already, uh, what we've already grown and invested in. And then as we, as we talk for the next few minutes, uh, um, and progress up these up these points, they'll become more and more important in terms of absolutely getting the best crop that uh, that you can get away with. Now, just from from our perspective, so that you're aware, um, Ontario, of course, as as we all know, is an absolutely massive uh, province, but most of it is not suitable for agriculture for obvious reasons: the Canadian Shield, boreal forest, uh, tundra, etc. So we have about eight and a half million acres of, of field crops in the province and uh, soybeans are grown right, essentially the vast majority of soybeans are grown below this line that I've drawn here. Um, so as you can tell from this map, of course, that's also where it's the warmest. And um, interestingly enough, just uh, this, is, this is not really a soybean thing, but one of the you know, challenges that we have in the Southwest is, is a lot of expansion of cities and uh, even towns. There's, uh, you know, subdivisions going up everywhere. And uh, that there is more of this kind of rural urban um, conflict, let's call it, uh, with equipment um, that we see on a regular basis. And this, uh, this oval that I've drawn here, half of all Canadians, not just people in Ontario, but half of all Canadians live in that little oval. So uh, it's amazing actually how many um, people uh, have chosen to live in, in this part of the world compared to uh, the rest of, of Canada. So uh, with respect to soybeans, 3 million acres, which uh, means that every spring here in Ontario, uh, about half of the acres that are planted are soybeans. And that's of course, because if you, if you consider that there are 2 million acres of corn, roughly a million acres of winter wheat and uh, some, some uh, forages and pasture along with a, a bunch of other crops, uh, that's where I come up with that roughly half of annual spring seeding is soybeans in the province. So it's a huge deal for us. Uh, the five year average is 49 bushels. Last year, uh, 48, we had kind of a tough um, mid season in terms of it being too dry. And, and uh, you know, I want to congratulate uh, you uh, folks out there in Manitoba, 44.5 bushels is the last number I saw for 2022. And we, to be honest with you, are absolutely amazed at that. That's incredible, considering that soybeans are a 
subtropical species. You have to remember soybeans actually, you know, were never um, uh, grown in Canada, never mind in Manitoba or the West, uh, 40, 50 years ago. Um, all this, you know, progression has really been the result of incredible breeding. And, and originally soybeans are uh, subtropical species that need uh, a lot more heat than we have available to them. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's obvious that we're making great progress on the variety front. Okay, first thing um, I wanna mention here is uh, residue management. Uh, and, and of course, most of our soybeans here are grown after corn. And uh, we have moved to well over half, maybe even two thirds in some areas, uh, no till or minimal tillage. In recent years, we've, we've moved back to some more tillage just because uh, we've had such incredible corn yields and, and then seeding soybeans right into that can be quite a challenge. And here's a picture I took um, not that far from, from my home uh, in July. And you can tell these, these beans are not great, right? Like, who are we getting? Uh, fairly thin and a lot of corn residue there. You know, we had over 200 bushels of corn in that field last year. And then to just go in and plant soybeans right in on top of that residue without trying to deal with uh, the issues of that residue can be a real challenge. And uh, now before we get too excited about needing tillage for soybeans, you know, this field did, did still go 58 bushels, which is amazing when you look at that picture. Um, and you can tell that obviously September and even August were pretty great here to be able to get that crop. Okay, the other uh, thing that we get sometimes, and it's, it's localized for sure with all this residue are slugs. Slugs, there's no easy answer for um, other than doing some tillage. That's part of the reason why some growers have, have gotten away from um, strictly, strictly no-till. And um, here's a picture too of uh, this issue of a lot of residue. Like soybeans, of course, are a, an incredibly resilient species in that they can bounce back and most of the yield of course is established during the second half of the growing season. But here you can see in one experiment we did quite, quite a number of years ago where we removed the corn residue, just raked it off the surface. Boy, the growth of those beans early in the season. And the truth is it lasted throughout the whole growing season. You could see the difference, uh, just incredible. And then, uh, you know, here's a picture of course of uh, of some no-till beans that are doing very well. This, this grower, this is uh, my friend, Dr. Dave Hooker. Um, he's with the University of Guelph. He farms also. Uh, he, you can see he's going there with the corn rows, trying to stay off the corn rows. And, you know, we have a bit of a uh, back and forth a little bit. I prefer to see some uh, springtime minimal tillage in the area where I live, he's a little further south. And, uh, you know, he, he sent me this picture and he said, well, what, what's wrong with these beans? And, and the answer is really nothing, right? Um, uh, obviously they're coming along beautifully. And so I asked them uh, recently, how did they end up yielding? Um, and they went 60 bushels. So I, I certainly don't wanna say that no-till isn't working. It can work very well, but we do have to think about managing that surface uh, residue, regardless of the, the crop rotation you're in. Um, uh, it, it, it can be a yield detriment in, in the wrong kind of year if it ends up being a more stressful year for beans. All that corn residue is, is a problem for us. Okay, here's another one that's fairly obvious. But a field of soybeans needs to be really flat. And of course, what I mean by that is um, we can't have any um, uh, kind of ruts or um, dips. And the main problem with those, of course, is, is not only compaction, but that the combine header can't pick them all up. And we've come a long way with that, um, except sometimes if we have a wet, fall and then we try to no-till 
Here's again a pretty miserable looking field, to be honest. Uh, you can see that these uh, plants are not all in the same growth stage, which is the last thing you want. You want beans to emerge uh, in, a, in a few days. Um, uh, <clears throat> and here you, can, you can't see it so well on the picture, but look at the, this kind of uh, problem here, you know, five, even six inch ruts in that field. And of course that's unacceptable in terms of being able to capture those lowest pods um, of, of the beans. Now, you know, again, <laughs> uh, yeah, soybeans are a funny beast. This field also went 55 bushels, um, which is just, incredible when you look at that picture you'd think boy if you got 30 out of that you'd be happy and that's the way soybeans are as long as you can establish enough plants in august and even september are good it's it's incredible what beans can do right so we did some experiments rolling soybeans and this ridiculous picture here of this farmer uh, just up the road he was rolling his beans after they came up and i stopped uh, the 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 uh, operator, he was the farm hand. And I said, what are you doing, man? You're, <laughs> you're driving over these beans. And he said, uh, well, you know, the boss told me to drive, so I'm driving. And uh, yep, sure enough, this is uh, done by some growers here, um, rolling soybeans after they come up. And the, the concept is, of course, that you're actually stimulating more branching and, and uh, more, more pods and increasing yield uh, because soybeans are so flexible. If it's a hot day and, and you roll them, even up to the first, maybe second trifoliate, uh, they recover nicely. So we did some experiments with that. And at the end of the day, you know, most, um, in, right where I live, uh, rolling is really popular. It's not so much on clay soils in, in, the, in the deep south or in the Niagara region, but it, where I am, because we have rocks, that's mostly why people roll. Um, we did manage to see a small uh, yield increase where we rolled right after seeding, and that would be the normal way of doing things. And then around this question of first trifoliate or second trifoliate, uh, yeah, there was a statistical uh, real response over not rolling at all, but, um, you know, really the same as rolling right after seeding. So this has not gained much popularity, rolling the beans after. And the main reason is, of course, that where your tractor tires go, um, you can do some, some more damage and take out plants. And of course, you know, the headlands become a problem because rolling them twice and all that kind of thing is bad news. Once is fine, but twice can be quite deadly. So I personally am a fan of uh, rolling soybeans. I roll all my plots, but we do it right after seeding um, unless there's a real crusting potential in that field. And then we might wait until after they come up. And so, um, then we get into this question of this uh, uniformity, you know, does uniformity of the plant stand really make a difference? Because of course, you know, um, you can treat soybeans kind of like a forage crop and just put them on real thick, or you can treat soybeans like a corn crop and really concentrate on making every plant count, feeding every plant, and then also trying to get each individual plant to live up to its potential, where, you know, if you look at it the other way, just having a thick, thick canopy, you're more looking at the overall um, canopy closure and you're not worried about individual plants. So does this uniformity matter? And, uh, you know, here's some pictures from a seed drill. Um, and you can see it's not a bad, bad row of soybeans, uh, except for these gaps. And now, of course, with the seed drill, you're going to have those anyway, right? Because that's just the way the seed comes out. And then you're going to have some bunching of the seed. Does that really matter? Well, the quick answer is not if you have enough plants per acre. It really makes no difference if you have enough plants per acre. If you're trying to uh, be exact in terms of 
lowering your plant population to the place where you can um, get just the minimum number of plants so that you can save some seed and so that you can use wider rows, maybe use a planter and uh, try to feed the individual plants through some fertilizer in a two by two band. Then of course, these things do start to matter. And naturally, you know, you're, uh, this is the other problem back to that residue. Sometimes if the, if the row unit uh, skips over or the opener skips over some, some residue, these big gaps are, are a problem for soybeans for sure. Um, we we kind of say you can, you can tolerate a foot um, in terms of gaps as long as they are not on both rows or uh, um, on the row opposite or beside that one, obviously, right? So um, you have to understand some of our soils are very high in clay content and uh, that can be a real issue when you're seeding in seven and a half inch rows because of course the poor little plants can't help each other out of the ground. And so, you know, one of the struggles that we have, no question, is achieving a good uniform plant stand. And so I got pretty frustrated with all this in, in my trials. Um, I started out with um, a drill and then I finally decided, um, I was kind of like this guy here. I just kind of had enough. This guy's not having a good day on the job. <laughs> I have to laugh every time I see this ridiculous video. Um, he just absolutely loses it. And yeah, you gotta be careful these days. You never know who's, <laughs> who's watching. Anyway, the point of that ridiculous video, sometimes you just had enough and I had enough. So I went to a, a row unit planter, which of course does a much better job in 15 inch rows in terms of accuracy. And I can honestly say that, um, you know, since I went to that um, kind of a unit, and of course, you know, it's small because we're doing experiments um, and uh, using a good fungicide seed treatments. We don't have stand problems anymore. We, ha we haven't had to replant anything oh, since, well, I shouldn't even say, right? I mean, touch wood because then we'll have a problem. But <laughs> since 2008, since we went to a good planter unit, we just have not had any problems. Um, you just get better accuracy, better placement. And so if you've got corn in the rotation, um, uh, I'm a big fan of um, precise planting of soybeans. You can reduce your seeding rate. Now, of course, in climates where you're desperate to get the canopy to close, it's a problem because seven and a halfs will out yield um, even 15s or definitely 30s in a very very low heat unit environment, but a lot of us down here, we have enough heat units, so it's it's not as a big of an issue. So in Ontario, we've kind of decided, um, looking at the data that in terms of understanding what the final plant stand should be, that you need about 2 million nodes per acre. Well, what in the world does that mean? You know, a node on the main stem is of course where the pods hang, where the branches um, come off and where the, the flowers um, start and then the pods develop. Uh, so I'm talking about nodes on the main stem. We, we'll get some nodes on branching plants for sure and you can count them as long as they don't come uh, too late in the growing season. And so how does that help us? Well essentially it comes down to how many nodes per plant you grow. So on heavy clays, uh, even maybe some later planting dates, uh, if you look at the bottom there, you need 200,000 plants per acre times 10 nodes to get to that 2 million. If you're on silty loam soils where the grow, beans grow nice and tall, you only need 100,000 plants because you'll have 20 nodes. Um, so the right planting rate for us has a lot to do with soil type, planting date, a little bit with row width, but not so much really. It has more to do with your final plant stand. And like I said, we're looking for about 2 million nodes per plant, per acre rather, sorry. 
So uh, final little thought on establishment. You know, we've, we've chased this for a few years now. What is the right depth? And, um, and, and this kind of came up a few years ago because there was some work out of um, the U.S. that showed maybe we should be seeding a little deeper to get maximum yield, better, you know, moisture down there, better um, uh, consistency of soil temperatures. If you, if you get really cold in the spring, you know, that, that thought process. Well, I'm firmly in the camp that um, shallow is, is better for soybeans as long as there's enough moisture to get them out of the ground. And we've done this quite a few times now. This is a picture of just a, a spot where it worked out beautifully. You know, we threw some seed on the surface. It rained two weeks after, and they did actually come up, um, you know, half an inch depth and then one and a half and so on. And it's pretty obvious from this picture that one and a half um, inches was, was ideal in this particular spot. Two inches was fine. But once you get into three inches or more, you really start to see some, some reductions in stand. And um, I did this mostly on silty loam soils. Um, so last year we tried it on some, some heavier clay soils. And these are the yields here. Um, and it's really kind of neat. You can, you can see again that that one and a half inches for us was a good spot to be. But the one inch, you know, on that heavy, heavier clay, as long as we got some rain was, was just as uh, productive. But here's the interesting part, you know, even at two inches, you can see we went from, from 73 bushels down to 70 bushels. That's a pretty big hit. Um, at two inches, and we, we had not seen that on siltier soils before, on loamier soils. So um, it does make me think that um, heavy clay soils, you got to be even more careful not to, not to punch them in too deep. Um, and of course, you know, it's still always this problem. If things dry out in the spring, what do you do? You know, it's fine to talk about these exact placements if you have moisture. And so that's the challenge. If you can't find any moisture, at one and a half inches, do you go to two? And the answer is absolutely. Uh, soybeans should be seeded into some moisture. On silty loams, we'll go to two and a half, no, no problem. But this, this data here does make me uh, wonder, you know, sometimes whether we, we are overdoing it. And, and there really is no evidence that I, I have been able to, to pull together in Ontario that shows deeper planting yields more. It's, it's usually the opposite. Now, just for fun, you know, again, we threw them on the surface, just kind of scratched them in a little tiny bit. And um, uh, yeah, they still yielded okay, 64 bushels, but you know, lost nine, nine over nine bushels to doing that. So we do need to get them into the ground if you expect uh, them to produce for us. Okay, so, um, you know, this, this question, you know, uh, is there still a penalty to wide rows? And when I say wide rows, um, I mean 30 inch rows. We have quite a push, especially in Eastern Ontario and the deep south to go back to using corn planters. And of course, it's partly because of seed costs. It's partly because of um, this issue of tramping later in the season, you can get in there better with, with a sprayer and so on. So there are some real advantages to using a planter. Um, and yet we all know that, uh, you know, if you look at the old research, 30 inch rows yield less. It's not a huge number, but it's usually two, three bushels, sometimes four bushels less than 15s. And in our situation, seven and a half would be the same. So we thought we'd redo some of this work to try and understand whether we could uh, close that yield gap. So we, we seeded uh, some different varieties of different maturity groups. And this first one I'm showing you, uh, this is a variety uh, called Viper. It's a 0 0.8 maturity group. And you can see, boy, it's a, it yielded really well, 75 bushels across, um, across three sites in 22. Pretty awesome but we did lose six bushels to going to 30 inch rows, um, a bigger number than I would have even guessed uh, to be frank, but that's, that's how it turned out. So that, this is why I personally am not a huge fan of wide rows. 
Um, there may be some situations where it makes sense, but personally, I'm going to stick with 15s. Um, I've just done it so many times, and usually it works out this way that there is a slight advantage. Now, the interesting thing we did learn um, there, there, the other varieties that we tried in these particular trials, as the maturity was um, uh, increased, in other words, a longer season soybean variety planted on the same day as the others in the same experiment, they suffered a little bit less from this yield lag to wide rolls. So if you are going to wide rolls and whatever that means in your situation, maybe it's only 20 inches um, or 22 inches, keep in mind that variety selection is very important um, in terms of not taking a yield hit when you move to wider rolls. That's really the point of what I'm trying to get at. Okay, so um, then of course, you know, the, the, the question comes up, can you uh, reduce some of this yield gap by feeding those soybeans a little bit more in 30 inch rolls? And what we tried is to apply 10 gallons of 28% just on the, on the soil surface, just off the road, two inches over to get a little bit of extra early season growth, fill that canopy fast. And then we sprayed those beans also with a fungicide at R2.5. And uh, the, the concept here is of course, that if you have wide rows, maybe you can get the fungicide in there a little bit better and get a bit more of a yield response to a foliar fungicide. Now, none of our sites in 2022 had white mold or any real significant diseases. So keep that in mind when you're looking at the, at the yield numbers here in a second. So yeah, that 28%, no question. It, it, uh, on the right hand side there, we can see that the beans early in the season do grow a little faster, a little more vigorously. And you can see it from the road, they're a little darker green, of course, um, uh, with that small amount of nitrogen. And, you know, we don't feel that at, uh, at 30, 30, roughly 30 pounds of actual N are impacting nodulation at all. In fact, you know, we have some pretty good data to show that you can apply 50 pounds and it's uh, negligible, the amount of loss in terms of nodulation. So we don't get too excited about that. Um, but the, the real problem with this whole scenario is the following. You know, we got only 1.6 bushel response uh, at gain to end there um, in this particular uh, scenario. Yeah, and I saw uh, just now a question and answer come up. Feel free to type in your questions as we're uh, going along here and we'll leave them to the end. I'll make sure I, I leave some time at the end and we'll try to address anything here um, or, or whatever comes to mind really. Okay, so 1.6 bushels, uh, not enough to get really excited about, but I mean, it, it was statistically real. And then of course, the, the question comes up too, um, how does that how does that compare to 15 inch rows? And interestingly enough, in 15 inch rows, yeah, we did get a slightly little, smaller response, but the numbers are all pretty pretty small in terms of a response anyway, right? Uh, but it does give me some hope that maybe in 30 inch rows we can get a little bit more out of um, out of some of these inputs. Okay, so <clears throat> now we're getting into some of the more important stuff uh, in terms of really trying to maximize uh, potential, you know, protecting your investment. And of course, by that, I'm talking about, um, uh, you know, do we need to apply some extra fungicides or insecticides? Um, and uh, we, we, we've uh, since 2004, that's when, you know, the soybean rust scare kind of came into Ontario and it's never really blown up in Ontario. But at that time, a lot of the companies started to register foliar fungicides. The one we tried last year was new to, to me, Delero Complete. And you can see it's, it's also available for corn. And so there's a whole uh, number of diseases, including some corn diseases on this list. 
And the label says, you know, you can spray anywhere from R1 to R5, which is quite a window. And, and, and that is one of the issues we've had with these fungicides. When do you actually spray? Uh, <laughs> because uh, that is not very helpful, right? That is, gives you basically a, a six or even seven week window there. Um, we we uh, feel that if you're going to apply once, from our trial data, R2, uh, somewhere between R2 and R3, so that's full, full flower to early pod set is the right time to spray if you're going to only spray once. So here's, here's something that we learned. So at Allura in 2022, uh, planted in May and June across uh, that, um, that trial, and you know, all these are replicated obviously uh, no response essentially, right? Um, statistically nothing, 0 0.4 bushels. It was kind of dry there. So disappointing for sure in terms of uh, profitability, but again, also no disease. So this is why as an industry in Ontario, we have not uh, gone to spraying all soybean acres with a fungicide. In fact, it's, it's the minority, but we are still, um, uh, working towards understanding when and where there is a response because we have seen some really nice numbers. I personally in trials have seen up to 12 bushel response to a foliar fungicide, um, but it's really hard to predict. Obviously, if you've got white mold, that's, that's um, a scenario where we get more of a response. Um, but other than that, you know, we've been at this for a lot of years and it is still very difficult to predict when and where you get a big response. What, one observation we, we had from last year is that, you know, in these big crops, so you can see there at Winchester, we had a trial average yield of almost 89 bushels, just awesome, right? And that's where we started to see a bigger response, 3.4. Again, no real diseases there to speak of. But, you know, once you're talking three, four bushels, um, we get pretty excited about foliar fungicides and protecting our investment. Um, so this is still a work in progress. I do know for sure that sometimes in some environments, we, we have a nice response. And, and one of the things that we're pursuing is, of course, uh, fields that have a lot of soybeans in the rotation, um, soybeans after soybeans, we seem to get a bigger response to these foliar fungicides. And we do have some acres like that in the province. <coughs> Soybean aphids, of course, uh, are uh, quite regional. Eastern Ontario gets hit more. And this is a, a problem, of course, uh, upcoming because we're not going to have Matador available anymore to us. And so um, um, an agronomist out there that used to work for the Ministry of Agriculture, Jill Connell, um, did some trials at the Winchester Research Station in the last couple of years, um, comparing Matador to Safina, which is a, a newer product. And here's kind of the interesting learning. Um, he sprayed here um, as the aphid populations were naturally declining anyway. And of course, that's the way soybean aphids are. Sometimes they just um, have reached their peak and start to go down, either because of temperature or beneficials, um, eating them and destroying them. And so when you see that the natural uh, aphid level is declining anyway, like this, uh, the, the yield was just not improved by applying a fungicide. That makes total sense to me. That was in 21. In 22, uh, the aphid numbers were really exploding. You can see that that line there, that check line increasing all the way to, to uh, over 2,500 aphids per plant. So it was sprayed here. Um, and as we would expect, much nicer yield responses, um, uh, you know, six, seven, nine bushel response to aphid control. That's pretty awesome. And so we feel that we have a pretty good alternative to Matador um, this, this coming year, as long as supplies are there. But we are certainly um, monitoring that situation in terms of 
um, you know, insecticide availability. Okay, so uh, final couple thoughts here and we'll wrap it up. Um, there's no question that planting early um, is on average a good idea. Um, and if what happens is of course, is those soybeans have a slightly longer growing season because they can take advantage of any heat that is there in the spring. And the other thing that we've learned it's not just about heat, it's about light intensity. The light intensity of um, a day in July is significantly better than a day in August. By the time you reach the 10th of August, even though you know we feel it's like the middle of summer and it is in some ways, the light intensity is not there for us anymore. And as you get to late August, it might be half of what it is uh, at the peak uh, in July. And that's part of the reason why early planting makes um, a good sense. And we've even gone, gotten to the place where we wonder if we should plant soybeans before corn. So, um, and part of the logic is of course there, you know, if you plant your beans early, maybe you can get them off uh, earlier as well. And, and that is true, obviously, they, they uh, especially with short season beans, they're really not that photo period sensitive anymore. It's more about day length, uh, or it's more about, uh, sorry, days to maturity. It's, it's more about the variety, um, not so much about uh, the uh, length of the day in terms of the photo period effect, um, especially with short season varieties. And so we've been planting in some very early windows, basically that first window uh, in April, the last couple of years, it's ranged from the 18th to the 28th and comparing that to uh, May, June, July plantings. And I'm just showing you the, the May here to keep things straightforward. And we're, we're comparing them uh, to corn. This is across a number of hybrids and varieties. And you can see that uh, really so far, absolutely, there's no question um, early planting is good, right, uh, for corn. Um, but super early planting, well, our data doesn't really show it, right? Um, if you're in that early part of May, even mid-May, uh, pretty good. Uh, and, and the soybeans, how did they react? Well, they responded exactly the same, really, in terms of um, a yield, uh, no real benefit to that super early. So again, I'm not showing you the June, like the June things really drop off. We lose between five and 10 bushels. And as you get into July, we'll lose another five to 10 bushels. Um, compared to these numbers, the, the whole point I'm trying to make here is that the soil still has to be fit. And even if it's fit, because we planted these beans into fit soil, the idea of super early planting in our environment um, really it has not proven itself to be significantly better. It's still good. We still do it because we can get those beans off in a timely fashion in the fall. But from a straight yield perspective, not all that different, right? So um, this is a bigger issue if you have um, enough heat units where you can choose to grow a shorter day bean or a longer day bean. Of course, this is all dependent on whether they will finish in the fall, but there's no question that when we look at our variety trial data, so this is from maturity group zero, you know, 25 to 2,800 heat unit beans that the, across the bottom days to maturity. So that's just the genetic um, requirement of those varieties to finish, how many days they take to finish and the yield across the left-hand side there. You know, as we move from a maturity group 0 0.3 to a 1.2, so basically a one full maturity group longer planted at the same sites um, on the same day and all that good stuff, you know, we're picking up 10 bushels. So this just drives home the point that no matter where you are, I think in the world, you need to choose a variety that is adapted, but is 
Abe doesn't finish too early in the fall. Um, and maybe that's irrelevant to you because you're just happy if they finish. <laughs> And that's and that's fair. So we'll we'll uh, we'll carry on. Here's the thing I want to just spend the last couple of minutes, and then we'll be finished. We're really um, coming to the point, or at least personally, I can say that I am 100% confident that the difference between a field that goes 50 bushels per acre, you know, and that that would be a pretty nice field for us, but just average these days. And one that goes 100 bushels an acre is only two things. It's nutrient availability to the plant. And of course, that means you need to have enough moisture in the ground to pull in the nutrients, but you also need those nutrients available in the ground. So it's not as simple as throwing down fertilizer, but it is essential that the soil has um, the, the nutrients in there so that if you get the moisture, you can get through mass flow, the nutrients into the plant. And, and we're starting to build that data set. Here's uh, something um, that we we're trying in, in kind of a, a big input world. So you can see across the bottom there are intensive managed beans, and this is not economical. This is, we're just trying to get the soybeans to really live up to their potential. We're putting it down 200 pounds of mez, 100 pounds of K-mag, 200 pounds of Aspire, which is just a potash and a bit of boron. And then we're spraying them twice. And um, in this, this uh, upcoming year, we're also gonna apply a fair bit of nitrogen. Um, anyway, you know, where we applied that and, and I worked it in, uh, yeah. This is uh, what we got, uh, zero bushels per acre. And you're going to go, well, what in the world? What does that mean? <laughs> that kind of goes against what you were just telling us about being all excited in terms of fertility. Yeah, well, this is what happens when it doesn't rain, right? And, and this is why soybean agronomists uh, get so discouraged in terms of throwing on some fertilizer and not seeing a response. But look at this, you know, where we irrigated, um, and now we irrigated a lot, we had a 23 bushel yield increase to that scenario. So clearly, clearly it's um, a combination of nutrients and water. And then of course, you know, we took away the soil altogether. We planted those in the field in pots um, in a soil, soilless mix. And we got um, even uh, a better response. And, you know, in, in, we did have some disease in those plants because they were getting so big. If we looked at only the, the plants that were healthy, an estimated yield of well over 100 bushels. And, of course, that number is, is a bit of an estimate, so don't, um, don't get uh, too excited about that. But the, the fundamental issue of whether the nutrients in the water together take you from 50 to 100 bushels is in my mind, um, uh, that's, that's the difference, right? That's why beans abort so many pods and flowers is because they don't have enough nutrients in the plant at the right time. Okay, so yeah, we'll skip this. And um, Dennis, I'll turn it back to you. Um, I will be happy to answer that question if I can. I can't really read it, so maybe you can read it out to us. And if anyone else has any questions, uh, this is your chance. Alrighty. So uh, the question is regarding the row width affecting yield discussion. How do you separate the effects of row width from planting population? Is the yield reduction going to be thirty in, or is the yield reduction going to be thirty inch from fifteen inch a response to row width or population? Yeah. So. You. Uh, that's a good question. And and what you noticed and picked up on there is that in the scenario that I just showed you, we seeded the 15s at 165 and the 30s in, at 140. Because from other work, we feel that those are good numbers, high enough that we would not expect to see any uh, losses in terms of uh, not having enough plants down. So in previous work, we have um, done that with the same populations and row widths 
and come up with essentially exactly the same uh, problem that it is a row width problem, right? In other words, you cannot, if you think that if um, the, you were to see the same population with both row widths, that you will get rid of that yield hit to wide rows, um, that is not how the trials turn out. Uh, I've done them enough to, to know uh, that's not the issue. What we were trying to do there in that systems approach, um, if, if most growers here, if you, you know, tell them that you seeded 160 in 30 inch rows, they'll tell you, well, that's way too high. And so they, um, you know, they kind of uh, get upset at you for that. And that's why we, we chose a different seeding rate. It's more of a systems uh, approach. So I hope that answers that question. All so right. Dennis, let me let me ask you, Dennis. Then you know, um, I hit on that two million nodes um, per acre. Uh, what what is your seeding rate recommendation? Maybe we can just kind of leave it at, at that for for you folks. Um, is it is it significantly different from us? Like we're we're at about one sixty five in fifteen inch rows and higher yeah. in seven and a half. Yeah. So our established rate is one forty to one sixty. That's what we'd like to see in the field when it's all said and done. So ah, okay. however you get to however you get to that will be based on your type of seeding equipment. So growers are seeding anywhere from 180 to 200,000 uh, seeds per acre to get that 140 to 160. Yeah, it makes perfect sense to me. So slightly higher than our numbers because um, when we're seeding 165, we're ending up with 125 to 140, right? So yeah, no, yeah. excellent. Thank you. Yep. So we have another question here. Um, so what about products that enhance the plant's ability to uptake nutrients or cope with stress in drought conditions? Oh boy. Yeah, that's uh, that's a whole seminar in and of itself, isn't it? Um, uh, I appreciate the question, but it really comes down to which specific products um, we're talking about. Fundamentally, Soybeans do not respond well to any of that stuff. I'll be frank with you. I've tried over 20 years, um, at least 40 different products, and almost all of them do not change yield. Boom. It doesn't go. make me very popular with those people, but you know, my job is to tell the truth. Now, having said that, there here's the weird part. Some specific scenarios, some specific fields, you do get a response, right, to some of these um, additive products, I'll call them. And that's where it gets really hard. The other thing that I am convinced of is that a lot of these companies, in an attempt to keep the cost low, the rates they are applying are much too low. In other words, in the lab, these products actually do work. And then they cut that rate by tenfold or a hundredfold and expect them to work in the field. And so that's part of the issue. I can get some of those products to work, but I need to put down 100 times the rate uh, that is recommended. And so it's not economical, right? Um, right. But I don't have the whole answer on that. It's yeah. a good question. Excellent. So uh, with that, we're gonna shift over to our next presenter here. Um, uh, our soybean disease research update. Um, our research scientist, uh, Ahmed, um, is from the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada station in Morden. And uh, I'm going to turn the screen over to him. So Ahmed, if you would like to share your screen, and we'll start your presentation. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Dennis, for the kind invitation. And uh, I will share my slides right now. Can you see my slides? Yeah, looks good. Perfect. Hi again, everyone. Uh, my name is Ahmed. I am a research scientist with Agriculture Canada in Morden, Manitoba. I have uh, started my position actually, uh, April 12 will be exactly one year with Agriculture Canada. Uh, so right now my program is focusing on the pathology of oil seed, soybean, uh, canola, sunflower, and also I am uh, supervising the uh, pulse pathology lab, uh, working on dry beans and field B uh, uh, specifically. Uh, 
uh, for the soybean uh, research, uh, I have done some research in the past with the uh, plant science University of Manitoba. When I was a research associate, I will try to give you some uh, ideas about what I have done. Uh, I will update you also about some uh, survey results that has been uh, conducted by Manitoba Balsa Growers, published on their website. Uh, and my future uh, ideas about res res pathology research uh, in Southern Manitoba. Uh, so uh, first I will talk about uh, uh, the stresses that uh, soybean uh, can experience in field. It's biotic and abiotic stresses. Uh, I have few diseases I would like to talk uh, uh, briefly about. Uh, and this slide, soybean uh, uh, actually became or is worldwide one of the most important crops, uh, as uh, we know. Uh, it's produced in uh, the season 2020 and 2021 globally. It contributed to 70.9% uh, of the global supply of plant based protein meal. And also globally, it's a very important oil uh, source and, and con contributed to 28.8% uh, uh, of the global plant-based oil. Canada last year became num uh, came number seven on the list uh, after Brazil, United States, Argentina, China, India, and Paraguay. Um, so as I just mentioned, so soybean can uh, face uh, different stresses in the field uh, from biotic to abiotic, abiotic uh, anything from fungi to bacteria, viruses, nematodes, uh, plant parasitic, uh, parasitic plants, uh, weeds, uh, bio abiotic, which is non-infectious, can spread from plant to plant, and this is mainly from uh, the environment. Uh, the issue sometimes it can be misleading in the uh, or uh, a conf uh, there's some confusion in the field to know whether it's uh, a biotic disease or it's uh, abiotic stress. So careful uh, diagnosis sometimes it's uh, highly recommended. Uh, one of the uh, most two common. Uh, leaf diseases that we can see here and actually worldwide two diseases bacterial leaf blight and septoria brown spot uh, bacterial leaf blight and a septoria brown spot usually they uh, coexist together they or occur on the same plant and if the diagnosis hasn't been done carefully or early before the uh, infection progresses it will be so hard to differentiate between between these two uh, because also they have uh, similar symptoms except few differences and they also require similar weather conditions. So it's important to know whether we are seeing brown spot or bacterial blight uh, for the control management. Uh, bacterial blight is called by bacteria Sidmonus aeringi uh, and the pathogen overwinters in crop residue. And once the uh, environment is uh, conducive or conditions are conducive, uh, the bacteria can splash and start the infection through natural wound openings or wounds. Uh, and it can happen like at V1 stage. Uh, leaf wetness and temperature uh, is uh, key for the infection to happen. And hot and dry weather will uh, put the infection on hold will stop it. Uh, so bacterial leaf light starts as uh, small uh, lesions surround brown ones surrounded by yellow halo, which we use it as a key to uh, say whether it's bacteria blight or brown spot. So this yellow halo around the uh, around the spot, brown spot or the lesion, it's very uh, important early in the season. But when the um, infection progresses, this will go because all these spots will merge together and give this rigid 
uh, appearance as you see in uh, slide C. Uh, septoria uh, is a fungus and uh, the fungus known by septoria brown spot or just brown spot. And this fungus survives also in win uh, is um, overwintering um, on soybean uh, or any debris in the soil. And during rainfall events, the conidia uh, spores uh, in that image, the lower one, will splash and start the infection. Uh, the, uh, they don't need uh, natural openings or wounds because they uh, have the, these spores have the ability to start the infection even on the intact surfaces. Uh, also, the infection, as I just mentioned, uh, with the bacteria blight, they can occur early in the season, uh, starting from the V1 stage, this uh, infection can happen if the conditions are humid or uh, the enough moisture occurs, as long as also the weather is not too hot. Uh, it's again, it's it's confusing to uh, to differentiate between these two, as you can see in the pictures or in the images. So uh, a key again, uh, when I talk about these diseases, always look at the yellow halo around the spots. If you see the spots just brown and they are not surrounded by any yellow halo, this is septoria. If surrounded, it's uh, bacterial light. Even when it advances. Uh, as you can see in the lower surface or upper surface on that uh, image on the left, uh, it's still the, um, the this yellow you can see it came because uh, the leaf is dying. Uh, the chlorophyll has been destroyed. This is why um, uh, you can see this yellow in general spreading around the leaf. In that survey uh, that I found <clears throat> at the uh, on Manitoba Pulse the Grower uh, Association here in Manitoba, the website, they surveyed 54 soybean fields. And um, at uh, the uh, R1 and R5 stages. And bacterial blight and septoria were the most common foliar diseases in soybean in Manitoba, infecting 91 and 90 and 81%. But the severity was too low. So they didn't cause any like um, serious yield uh, losses. And in these cases, for any foliar disease, the um, yield losses caused or uh, happened because of the destruction to the chlorophyll. So the photosynthetic area has gone. So the yield is re reduced. If the severity, you can see the infection, spreading, but if the most important, how severe the infection is. So uh, this year was uh, below when the severity, this means uh, almost no uh, yield losses because of these two diseases. Another one <clears throat> which has been seen in previous years in Manitoba, um, but the survey also, I didn't participate in this survey this year because I'm still building my lab here in Morden, so I wouldn't be, I couldn't be, or I haven't been invited this year to be part of the foliar disease survey, but I, I have been participated in previous years with David Kamenisky from Manitoba Agriculture. And we have seen frog eye uh, uh, spot in the past, but this year they, it hasn't been observed. Uh, although it can be a very, very damaging disease in certain years. And in the US, uh, it's it's uh, one of the top serious diseases when we talk about foliar diseases in soybean. The disease caused by a fungus called Cercospora, and the infection can happen at any stage, but usually uh, you can see it clearly after flowering. And they are very, uh, they have very distinct symptoms. Um, you can see angular uh, spots, uh, uh, looks like eye of frogs, that's why they give it this name. Uh, young leaves are more susceptible, while older leaves are more resistant. Uh, uh, so A, this is what you see in image A, this is what you see early in the season, when the infection is still uh, a little bit fresh, but the spots can be smaller than this. Later during the season and when the infection progresses, and again, if the environment is conducive for this disease, you can see what we see in image B. Uh, so the spots get darker brown, surrounded by dark reddish brown uh, margins. 
And uh, if you flip uh, the um, uh, leaf, infected leaf, you can see sporulating lesions. Actually, this white fuzzy growth or grayish, uh, gray fuzzy growth, it will be the uh, uh, conidia spores, which in image C2. So again, uh, this disease, according to the Amatobots uh, Global Association website, it hasn't been um, observed in the 54 uh, soybean fields surveyed this season. But maybe it existed in some other fields for sure. Um, downy mildew, downy mildew, another uh, important disease on um, uh, soybean, but it requires very, very specific uh, conducive environment conditions. Uh, it, uh, humidity should be too high for this uh, fun fungus to cause damages and uh, moisture also very important. Otherwise, the fungus will not be able to spirulate. And it's uh, a biotroph fungus, uh, so it's very picky fungus to cause severe damages, luckily. Uh, downy mildew also wasn't observed in uh, the previous year uh, or previous season. And uh, I put uh, on my slides a reference for the Metropolis Global uh, website uh, if you like to uh, go uh, and see uh, what they have done this year for the survey. Another important disease uh, is a stem canker. And uh, I was lucky enough that I was uh, uh, reported this disease for the first time in Manitoba back in 2018, as I believe I will show you the, it was uh, 2018, yes. Uh, so this disease uh, issue, soybean, uh, as definitely, <laughs> I am maybe the <clears throat> one who just recently or newly started working this, uh, on soybean, but uh, soybean, pathology in Manitoba, in my opinion, is still infant. Uh, um, it still needs lots of differently research because maybe the acreage still this year was uh, this one, then one million acre comparing to canola or wheat. But hopefully in the future, when the acreage will increase of soybean in Manitoba, uh, I think many diseases will start to occur, or we maybe with the increase of the acreage, we will start seeing more diseases that we couldn't observe because in North Dakota, there are some diseases that they uh, have seen. We didn't report it here yet in Manitoba. Do they exist? I believe they exist. But again, because of the acreage is still not that huge, but in the future, I think we will see this. So uh, northern stem canker is an important disease, and the issue with this, with this disease, uh, it can um, uh, be very confusing uh, when you see also phytophthora. So um, if you do like a survey or whatever you do for soybean, sometimes you see phytophthora, but you think it's stem canker or vice versa. And the, the key for this is the root. So uh, the uh, phytophthora is called phytophthora stem and root rot. So for, uh, and I think Dennis will talk about this, so I don't want to talk too much about it. Um, but there are two types of the stem canker, northern stem canker, which we can see here in Manitoba and North Dakota, South Dakota. Uh, and another one, southern stem canker, which uh, caused by the same genus of the fungus, but different species. And it's prevalent in southern United States because the fungus requires uh, warmer temperatures to spread, spirulate and spread. Uh, northern stem canker, this year, again, I'm like, referring to the survey conducted by Manitoba Balsa Growers. Uh, this year, uh, they have seen it infecting 15% of soybean, uh, 54 fields surveyed. So this can tell you this, uh, this disease actually is spreading about the resistance of this disease among uh, the cultivars uh, used by farmers here in Manitoba. I don't have enough information about this, whether there is enough uh, resistance for this, this disease or not, uh, but definitely it's uh, one of the important diseases because if it's severe, the plants are gone, the whole stem are gone, as you can see in the pictures. 
So the early symptoms include slight, slightly reddish brown lesions, as you can see in number A. If you cut the stem as B, you can see even the, um, the, the tissue inside the stem also affected. Uh, and C actually for the phytophthora. So as you see in the phytophthora, the root starts from the root and goes up uh, through the stem. But in the case of stem canker, as in A, actually it's the node. It's like in the middle of the stem or part of the stem. And the above uh, the affected area and below the affected area is still green, only the affected area. Uh, and again, we published this one uh, when I was with the uh, University of Manitoba in 2018. Uh, I don't want to keep talking about this one, but uh, it's the only thing I want to mention here is uh, an image A. So as you can see, the stem canker, uh, you can see still green areas on the stem uh, and uh, above or below the affected area. Another disease which is uh, very uh, it's, it spreads uh, uh, widely, and you can see it in most seasons. Uh, but for again, according to the surveys, uh, previous season uh, it hasn't been observed. But I have seen it when I was uh, part of the survey in the past. Um, it's caused by uh, it's a fungal, fungal disease, and mainly it affects the stems and buds. Uh, caused by fungus called tetracum. And uh, usually this disease is uh, coexists with another disease. Uh, so as we mentioned, it's a bacterial blight and brown spot. This disease, you can see it was another disease. I will talk about it now, which is uh, uh, both uh, and stem blight. So the difference between both uh, quickly, so the enthracnose, you can see like uh, these uh, uh, plotches. So uh, on the stem, uh, like black, uh, uh, large spots. In the case of uh, this disease, which also we reported here in Manitoba, uh, no, the, the, the disease is like you see black raised specks in linear rows. Uh, that this is the difference, how to differentiate between enthracnose and blood stone. Blood and stem blight uh, is a more serious disease because it can lead to another uh, serious symptoms, which is uh, seed decay, if the infection is uh, severe. And in the past, uh, Dennis kindly uh, gave me some samples. He got it from one field. Uh, as I remember, one field or more, uh, maybe Dennis remembers this and he can correct me. Um, and we found actually a severe uh, infection with this fungus, which is a diaborthia and chicola. And it's called fomopsis because fomopsis because fomopsis is a complete stage for this fungus. And uh, uh, again, according to the survey, it hasn't been observed this year, but we reported this one back in 2022. Uh, but actually, we received the samples before this, but we didn't, and we did the work, but we didn't publish it until uh, 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 22. Uh, another disease hasn't been reported here in uh, Manitoba. Uh, I think it has been reported maybe in Ontario. Uh, it's, it has been reported in North Dakota, and I think it exists, but we didn't see it yet. Uh, this is why I think, again, with if we increase the ink, if the soybean acreage will be increased, more diseases will be will start to be seen. Uh, this fungus caused by Cercospora. Uh, uh, Kokichi, and it's a late season. Uh, most of the serious uh, foliar diseases is they uh, they can occur. Uh, or they are obvious uh, during the late season. Uh, and uh, they uh, cause, or the symptoms are purplish discoloration uh, of young our most leaves or the canopy. And the spots can expand and even in color to dark reddish purple to bronze. Uh, sometimes they are confused, can be, it's confusing. Is it the, is it, uh, the purple, uh, seed or it's some pearl. So actually the uh, some pearl will appear like more bronze 
but in this case, it's actually like reddish purple uh, spots. And uh, the disease, if the infection is severe, it can affect the seeds and cause uh, uh, what we say the, it's called, sorry. Uh, sorry, it's called the purple seed stain. And this is a very damaging uh, 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 for the uh, yield because uh, the value will be totally uh, 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 listened. Uh, again, this disease hasn't, luckily, hasn't been seen yet in here in Manitoba. Uh, another disease is a mosaic um, a virus. Uh, I haven't seen it before here in Manitoba, but it's, again, reported in North Dakota, and we in North Dakota usually have a very similar uh, environment. So if something's seen in North Dakota, this means High likely, uh, or most likely, I mean, it's it's here, but we couldn't see it yet. Or maybe it has been seen by some people, but it hasn't been reported. Uh, so the mosaic, because uh, the symptoms uh, will be a, like a mosaic of light and dark greens. And also this virus can affect the seeds, but not like the purple stain. In this case, it um, uh, the seeds uh, from infected plants can be like mottled, uh, black or brown. Um, another uh, serious disease, it's, uh, it's one of the most damaging diseases all, uh, across the world, but uh, we are too lucky that we don't have it here in Western Canada, because this fungus, which is a soybean rust, uh, the, um, the, the pathogen cannot uh, uh, overwinter here because of the harsh winter. So we are too lucky that we have this environment. Uh, uh, because it prevents uh, some serious pathogens from uh, exist here. But it's uh, globally, soybean rust, it's uh, so important uh, disease in China, India, uh, uh, Brazil, very devastating disease. Uh, this disease, sometimes people can see it in the field and uh, uh, it's uh, confusing with the frog eyes, disease, but it's it's not frog eye. It's called something called philostatica, and it's very minor disease, doesn't even require uh, any management, uh, but it's important to know how it looks like. So and, uh, uh, people know uh, what they see in their fields. Uh, and it's totally different from, again, from the frog eye spot. Uh, and, this disease and the coming disease, uh, definitely they are the, the sudden death syndrome and cyst nemat, uh, nematode. Uh, cyst nematode and sudden death syndrome. Usually they, uh, uh, again, one of these two diseases, they occur together. Uh, and the theory that the infection starts with the soybean cyst nematode, heterodera, and then the fusarium, uh, uh, sudden death syndrome can start the infection. Uh, it hasn't, uh, to my knowledge, and talking to colleagues, I know that only one or two plants has been seen in the past and some isolation has been done. Uh, so it has been seen, but uh, is it spreading? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, no more reports came about this disease at all. Uh, does it exist? I think yes. <laughs> but uh, more uh, maybe surveys or careful surveys um, are required to know the situation of this or the status of this disease here in Manitoba. Uh, so it's in USA, it's causing billions of dollars uh, or sorry, millions of dollars uh, losses uh, from year to year. Uh, and it starts with these unique symptoms on the leaf. Uh, and then if uh, we split the lower stem, we can see the uh, tan brown discoloration in the interior tissues. In severe cases, as you can see in image B1, you can see actually uh, pale blue fungal spores are growing uh, even on the outer layers of the root. Uh, this one, I think also Dennis will talk about this one, so I will not uh, uh, talk too much about it. But I just want to mention that soybean cyst nematode uh, has been reported uh, back in 2019 by Dr. Mario Tenoda from Soil Science uh, University of Manitoba. 
Um, and there are a few reports about the diseases in Manitoba, but the good thing is that it's um, uh, that uh, quantification, when it has been done, they found that it's very extremely low. Uh, usually, usually, uh, as a point of reference, uh, a field infested with 10,000 eggs, bare 100 grams of soil, this could um, uh, cause about 50% uh, or more yield losses. Uh, what they have found here in Manitoba, it's way, way <clears throat> less than this number. It's about 1 to 14. Says, um, I found another number also, but it's still very, very low number. Is this one can spread? The good thing, nematodes can spread <clears throat> like other pathogens. Uh, it must spread through uh, soil. If soil has been moved or transferred from a place to place, this is the only way, or with machines for sure. So it's there are certain ways um, uh, to contain the spreading of soy uh, uh, system methods, the heterodera glycines. Uh, and also it's important to know uh, the difference between the nodule and the cyst on the plant. So the, uh, the cyst is white, very tiny comparing to the pinkish color or pink color for the rhizobium nodule. Uh, resistance available and it can resistant varieties can be used, but the issue each of those germplasms uh, uh, carry specific genes because there are populations of the nematodes, and each gene works against effectively against certain populations. So it's important to rotate source of resistance. And also, it's important to know which population of the nematode, uh, which the heterodera, the genus, uh, the farmer, if he found it in his farm, which population of the nematodes exist in this farm. Uh, also, cropping sequences should be should include non-host crops. So far, corn is a non-host uh, for the uh, soybean cyst nematode. Charcoal rot. Charcoal rot also a very serious disease worldwide. In Manitoba, it hasn't been reported yet. Uh, uh, but again, it can be seen here because the environment for, uh, the conducive environment for this disease can occur sometimes here uh, in, uh, in, the, in Manitoba. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm doing with the time. Okay, I'll try to finish soon. Uh, Fusarium root rot. Fusarium root rot is the most wide. Uh, it's if it's spread as uh, or spreading year after after year. The issue with this one: several species of fusarium are involved in the uh, root rot. Uh, the roots are uh, totally uh, in severe cases are totally gone, uh, comparing to the control as you see in the picture. And this is from a greenhouse experiment. Uh, the survey has been conducted by Manitoba Valsic Growers. They found it actually observed in 100% of the fields. Again, it's observed. This is just not the severity. We're not talking about severity. The disease can exist, but with low uh, uh, severity. But uh, it exists in 100% of the fields they surveyed. This can tell you uh, it's very spreading. And again, part of why Fusarium root rot on soybean spreading, because several species exist. Um, one issue with this disease, uh, the cross pathogenicity, few species, few species, uh, or many maybe, uh, because I reported by myself too, and there are more uh, in the literature, uh, like Fusarium germaniarum, Fusarium seriadis, Fusarium sprotelicutius, Cedro germaniarum, Avenisium, few species, or these species, I mean, they cause also Fusarium head blight on cereals wheat, oat, and barley. And this, uh, uh, what we call it cross pathogenicity. And there was one project uh, in plant science uh, studying this, but I think uh, more study, more research is needed uh, for the future uh, protection of soybean and cereals because uh, cross pathogenicity is an issue. Uh, and we reported actually this, like Fusarium sprotelicutis, which is well known that the Fusarium head blight, uh, involved in Fusarium head blight, uh, on oat, uh, we found it causing severe root rot on soybean. Also Fusarium cerealis, another species of Fusarium, causing severe root rot. Also, it's also 
known to be before that just visual in headlight. So cross pathogenicity is one of the, in my opinion, it's one of the hot topics uh, need to be investigated in depth. In one study also, I was involved in the rotation uh, and the crop rotation and the sequence of certain crops and how it can affect the root rot, fusarium root rot specifically. Uh, and it, uh, in that study, it had a continuous soybean, a canola soybean every second year, corn soybean uh, every second year, and soybean last year. And uh, this year, this study actually, I, I was part of it in plant science in the University of Manitoba. And it, uh, the lead uh, was uh, Dr. Uh, Yvonne Lolly. She is uh, an agronomist. Uh, and uh, I surveyed from three locations, uh, Meletta, Carmen, and uh, St. Adolf in Manitoba. <clears throat> and, but the sampling actually, I mean, uh, it was only for one year. So this data only for one year. Uh, and what, what, what I found at the time, uh, that the continuous soybean, it had the highest fusarium root rot severity. And corn soybean, wheat canola corn soybean, they had the lowest significant, significantly, I mean, they had lower numbers uh, when we talk about root rot severity. And this happened actually in Melitta, Carmen, and Kelburn. And these three locations are pretty geographically are uh, far from each other. Uh, um, I think there are number, still number of crop rotation studies are happening in Brandon, Manitoba, uh, to study this and the sequence of different crops. But crop rotation, I think it's worth uh, uh, studying, uh, but uh, it's a long-term, long-term game. And thank you so much. And I'm sorry if I talk more than I have been allowed for. Yeah, thanks, Ahmad. Um, yeah, just to, <clears throat> just to add one comment when you were talking about the Pomopsa seed decay. Um, it was interesting that year we had a few fields um, in the in the southern part of Manitoba, kind of south of Morris, and then kind of in that Morden area and around Altona that had Pomopsa seed decay. And um, some of the samples actually came back quite high uh, with uh, damage, even up to even upwards of ten uh, percent in the worst samples. But it was only for that one week. Uh, it was only in a few, a couple of different varieties, but it was a very short lived, but mm -hmm. where it was bad, it was really bad. So, and mm -hmm. since then we haven't really seen it before. So, um, mm -hmm. but no, that's good. No, thanks for the chat, for the uh, presentation here today. Uh, there's no questions currently. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to flip over to um, the main slide here. And then we're going to ask John Globoski here uh, to come in and, uh, and take over and do his presentation on uh, soybean insect uh, uh, soybean insect uh, updates here. And we're just gonna get that back into the presentation mode. Okay, John, uh, we'll get you to start presenting and open up your screen and away we go. Awesome. Okay, you can see my slides, Dennis? Yeah, looking good. That was good, okay, great. Um, so yes, what I'm gonna be talking on today is insect concerns in soybeans. And uh, so this slide here shows a list of potential insect concerns in soybeans. And I've broken it into a couple groups, early season and mid late season. And the two I've got in blue here are, are um, our sap feeders. Um, the ones I'm going to focus on are cutworms, soybean aphids, and grasshoppers. I'm going to skew my presentation to those three because those are the three that, uh, in recent years anyway, have been bigger concerns. We have had years where the odd field will see some wireworm issues or uh, in a drier year, maybe some spider mites. But relatively speaking, uh, they haven't been to the same extent that uh, things like soybean aphids, cutworms, grasshoppers have been. And some years, the so caterpillar can be an issue too. Um, but again, cutworms, soybean aphids, grasshoppers, I'm going to focus on those three a bit more. Um, I, I do have a few 
um, additional things I'll throw in as well. I do want to cover insecticides and particularly products that are having their labels amended and may not be available for this year. So we'll cover some insecticide stuff as well. So we'll start with cutworms in soybeans. And recently in Manitoba, um, the two species that have been quite dominant in our cutworm populations have been red-backed, which is in the middle, and dingy, the one you see on the uh, left in the screen. They, those have been our two dominant species. Cutworms generally go in a cycle where it almost looks like a bell curve where populations will build over a few years, uh, then they tend to peak and then they tend to drop off and then they'll cycle up again later. Often it's um, natural enemy driven. Uh, once populations get high, lots of their fungal pathogens, parasites, predators start doing better and things just start cycling. Uh, the, the populations will take them down and then they go up. But what complicates it is you've got different species of cutworms. Um, so sometimes one is peaking, the other is declining. What we've seen to uh, encounter in Manitoba though, um, I'm considering 2020 to be our peak year. 2020 was a really bad cutworm year. Um, widespread problems across the province. The last couple years, things haven't been as bad as 2020. We still do have cutworms um, to the point where uh, I would expect we will have some fields that are impacted next year, but again, not to the same level as uh, 2020, if our uh, trend continues. So they are still one to watch out for. Um, if you're wondering what this insect is on the right of my screen, I put this in because every now and then people will be digging around in the soil and find some of these and start worrying that they've got a cutworm infestation. Uh, that This is a crane fly larva. And crane fly larva, they are decomposers. They're feeding on decaying plant material. They will not feed on your soybeans, not a problem, but they are something that can easily be confused with a cutworm. I'm going to show you one other thing in just a while that can also be confused with a cutworm and isn't. So just a bit about cutworms um, and cutworm scouting. We tend, tend to uh, divide cutworms into three different categories or groupings. There's lots of different species and we tend to categorize them. Entomologists like to do things like that. So we've got these three groups. Um, above ground cutworms, that's things like your red back cutworms. This group, the above ground cutworms, they will feed at soil level quite a bit. So when they get to be bigger larvae, what they will do is they will clip a plant at soil level, feed on it a bit. Sometimes they eat the whole seedling. Other times they will eat just a bit of it, go back in the ground. And the next day when you're out crop scouting, you see these cut plants lying on the ground and you cue in that there's cutworms feeding in my field. Now Ron, another group that, yes. Can you uh, click the hide button on that, on your screen there? I will try. Oh, good. There you go. Uh, I did Perfect. Uh, crop talk uh, on Wednesday and my whole screen disappeared on me. So yeah, I was, really I was, I was a little nervous about doing it, but I figured I got to take a chance on it. So perfect. Thanks, okay. Sean. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, didn't, uh, climbing cutworms. Um, they're a group that can be really tricky because, um, climbing cutworms as their name, as the name of this group might imply, they like to climb up on the plants and feed, but they don't clip the plants. So they will come out of the soil at night. They will feed on the plant. You will see defoliation. Um, you may even have seedlings that are, are gone. Um, you may have other seedlings where there's been a bit of feeding. The plants aren't clipped. And when you scout during the day, you're not seeing any insects. You're seeing a little bit of defoliation to your plants. No insects, no cut plants. And it can be very deceiving. Um, if you're seeing that, start digging around those plants because uh, it could be a climbing cutworm species like dingy cutworm that's doing the feeding. And uh, many agronomists have been stumped by that. Um, usually when they call in describing, I've got all this feeding in my field, but I'm not seeing anything, I usually suggest to start digging around. It could be a climbing cutworm like dingy cutworm. 
Uh, the third group is our subterranean cutworms. And these are species like pale western cutworm that do all their feeding below ground and which makes them very difficult to control. Um, luckily, we don't have very heavy populations of these in Manitoba. Um, the pale western is more of a, uh, a dry land species. They do better in southwest Saskatchewan and eastern Alberta. We don't seem to have a lot here. Uh, the only subterranean cutworm that we see much of here is a species called glassy cutworm, but they're more of a grass specialist. So red-backed and dingy, they've been the main ones in our recent cycle. One of the th questions I've had in the past is people wondering, is there a good way to predict cutworms on a year-to-year -year basis, other than uh, me telling you that they go through these cycles? Um, people did do research on this back in the 80s and 90s. They tried putting um, but there are pheromones you can get for a species like redback cutworm, and people were putting these in traps and seeing, can we predict based on what we catch in the fall, what might happen in the spring? And it was not good data. Um, I shouldn't say it wasn't good data. It was good data, but it, it didn't show what they wanted. Uh, there wasn't really a good correlation between um, cutworm numbers in the traps and what happened the next spring. So um, there isn't really a trapping system that is good at giving you um, a forecast for cutworms for the following season. Really the best guidelines are what happened last year and um, what were you seeing locally in your area. Uh, use that to maybe prioritize your scouting and I would encourage you uh, just to get out and scout your fields um, in May and uh, early June and just try to pick up on any potential uh, cutworm issues. Regarding control for cutworms, there are both seed treatments and foliar insecticides. So as far as seed treatments go, uh, Lumiderm, the same product you use on your canola for cutworms, it's also available in soybeans and same active ingredient but different formulation for Tenza, um, also available as a seed treatment in soybeans for cutworms. So obviously using these, uh, you would use these if you've had a history of cutworms in your area or in a field and you're wanting some insurance of, regarding the cutworms. So you're putting these on without really knowing what the cutworm population is like in the coming year. Now, um, if you're scouting for cutworms and you know that you've got either a patch in a field that uh, might need some treatment or a whole field that uh, seems to have a heavy population. You do have a few foliar spray options. Um, Corrigin Max uh, or Corrigin, uh, that's probably one of the preferred products for um, cutworms and soybeans. It's got a very good residual and uh, works very well, but it will cost you a bit more than the products at the very bottom, the Silencer or the Bomba or this new one, Zavada. Um, th this group at the bottom uh, used to, well, it still does include Matador, but um, Matador won't be available in Western Canada this year. And I'll get to the reasons behind that in more detail later. But uh, Silencer, La Bomba, and this newer one, Zavada, will be available. Matador won't, but you do have these generic options. So they are a pyrethroid. They're in a different group than um, the Corrigin. And this other one in the middle, Viego, um, it's the same group as your Corrigin. It's more of a hort product. It works very well on cutworms, but you'll pay more for it. So um, these are your options. Uh, one note though, if you do use Lumiderm or Fertensia, when you read the label, it will say you cannot make a subsequent foliar application of anything in the same group, the group 28s, for a minimum of 60 days after planting um, seed treated with these products. So uh, if you do use a Lumiderm or Fertensa, just make a note if um, say you seeded um, mid-May with these products, uh, you're probably looking at about mid-July before you can go in with a product like Corrigin as a foliar spray for anything. So you, you, you won't need to be spraying for cutworms if you use these seed treatments, but suppose grasshoppers become an issue later on. 
Um, just keep that in mind. You need to wait 60 days after using these seed treatments before you can use a foliar version of that active ingredient. And just a few other tips on managing cutworms. Um, patch spraying sometimes can be an option. I mentioned uh, earlier about spraying a patch or a whole field. Uh, sometimes cutworms can be very patchy. And I'll, I'll just give you an example of a field that I went to one time. Um, we were looking at a cutworm patch and the farmer happened to mention to me, oh, this was also my thistle patch from last year. And this made total sense because when the cutworm moths are laying their eggs in the fall, um, they're a moth, they like nectar and a bit of cover. The thistle patch would have been really good habitat for these cutworm moths. So that's where they laid all their eggs. So the next year we had this, this very distinct patch in a field. Um, the rest of the field, we really couldn't find much in the way of cutworms just the odd one. So it was just the patch in that instance that needed to be treated. Uh, so cutworms can be patchy. So something to scout for. If you do note that, okay, we've got about a 10 acre patch that seems to have a lot, the rest of the field looks okay. Uh, you can save a bit of money uh, by just treating the patch. Also uh, do note cutworms are nocturnal. They feed in the evening, they hide in the soil during the day. So later applications are better. Try to get the product on as they're emerging or at least just before they're emerging try to get it onto the plants so uh, that might be good and if you have sprayed and you are out poking around the next day and you start noticing oh there's still some live cutworms here do not panic uh, cutworms go through this process called molting where in order to grow to their next stage, they have to shed their outer skeleton and um, kind of grow a bit and then reform that skeleton. This process is called molting and they're not feeding while they're going through this process. So they won't be up above the soil feeding. They'll just be in the ground doing their molt. They'll still be alive. Um, sometimes it takes a day or two to get through this molt. Um, so if you're poking around and you find the odd live cutworm, again, doesn't mean your product isn't working. Give it another day or two. Um, some cutworms could just be going through this molting process. Oops, I'm gonna go, oops, here we go, wireworms. Um, so onto wireworms. Um, wireworms uh, look a little different than your cutworms. There's no big fat legs at the back and they're usually uh, a bit of a thinner insect. Um, depending on the species, they can be smaller like these uh, wireworms here. This is our common species, Hypnoidus bicolor. I don't have a common name for this one. There is none. Um, th there's a larger species called prairie grain wireworm that is a bit more darker yellow and longer. Um, and they do have three small pair of legs up at the front, but no of the fleshy legs at the back like the cutworms would have. So you should be able to tell them apart. And they usually have this little notch at the back of their body as well. So easy enough to figure out. But one other difference between wireworms and cutworms is wireworms do all their feeding below the ground. They aren't going to come above the ground and feed like the cutworms will. So for you to try to manage them, if you have uh, in the past, say had a field that had a lot of wireworms, seed treatments are an option, foliar sprays won't work. You won't get the foliar sprays to the wireworms. So, um, anything you can do really to help get some quick germination and early growth might minimize the damage from the wireworms. And other than that, you do have a few seed treatments that can help. But uh, do note that these seed treatments don't do a good job killing the wireworms. What they do is they make the wireworms sick enough that they're not feeding for an extended period of time. And so your plants get off to a good start but the wireworms aren't killed. So um, I would say uh, you could sample your fields later in the season, um, in the late summer, or fall, but don't assume because we used uh, Cruiser or um, Lumiderm on our field this year that next year we won't have wireworms in that field. Uh, may or may not be the case. And, uh, 
one thing that I don't want you to confuse with wireworms is a fly larva that you may find in the field uh, called therivids. So uh, therivids, some people will call them stiletto flies. They're actually a fly, but they have these uh, very thin um, wireworm sized larva. So the, the, the uh, therivid larva is about the size of a prairie grain wireworm. So one of our larger wireworm species. One difference though is uh, they're much paler and they're very mobile, very active. If you are to poke at a therivid larva, it'll start squirming like crazy. Whereas the wireworm is much less active. And you, you'll tell just by the way, it's very rapidly wiggling. This isn't a wireworm. It uh, behaves very differently. They're very quick um, larvae. They're, they're legless, but they're very quick. Um, they're predators. They like to feed on things like wireworms, earthworms, uh, small cutworms they would feed on. Uh, so they're a good guy. They're helping you out. I've had many times when people have sent me either a photo or a sample uh, asking, are these wireworms and what should we do? And they're good guys. Don't need to worry about them. So moving on to aphids. Um, so I'm gonna give this a bit more time because uh, this probably is our uh, most major insect concern in soybeans in Manitoba. Just a bit of a background on aphids. We have lots of different types of aphids. Uh, there's been over 800 species identified in Canada. Not all of them overwinter here, but they can at least be found here for part of the season. And soybean aphid is an example of one that is very host specific. It's got two hosts, soybeans and buckthorn, and that's really it. Soybeans are the summer host, buckthorn is the winter and overwintering host. So right now, any there, there probably won't be much if any soybean aphids here in Manitoba right now. Uh, they generally get killed off here, but where they do overwinter, further south, they will all be on the buckthorn right now, not on, there aren't any soybeans for them, but they're overwintering on the buckthorn. And once the soybeans start coming out, they will start moving on to the coming year's soybeans. And uh, populations further south get caught up on the winds and that's how they end up in Manitoba. Once they get here, they what arrives um, in the spring, is a totally female population. Um, early in the season, aphids, they, um, they have what we call a parthen parthenogenic life cycle, where early on, it's strictly females in the population. Um, those females will start producing live young really quickly. And within a week or two of being born, those live young, then start producing their own young. Again, it's still all female in the population. So aphids are basically reproductive machines. They can build their populations up um, super quickly if they're not being contained. Um, and that's what makes them a big concern. But not to scare you, there's a lot of things that like to feed on aphids, which um, uh, Horst mentioned in his, in his uh, slide, showing, he showed a good slide of uh, where aphid populations will actually start declining at times. And that's because your natural enemies are um, uh, eating more than is currently being produced. And that can happen. So don't make the assumption because they can reproduce so quickly. You know, once you've got 250, it's gonna be 500 next week and 1,000 the week after that uh, is often not the case. The other thing I'll just mention in this slide is um, the way aphids feed, they feed on the plant sap and they secrete something called honeydew out of their back end. Um, they, they need to take in a lot of sap to get the nutrients they need. And so they produce a lot of this sticky sugary solution called honeydew. And uh, that does a couple of things. One, it'll coat the leaves and you get this um, sooty mold fungus that'll grow on the leaves. The other thing that it does do though is the smell of that honeydew is an attractant to some natural enemies of aphids. So the natural enemies will cue in on the honeydew and you will notice that they will be concentrating in areas of the field that have the higher aphid populations. Um, and 
because they blow in, there's really, it's hard to predict what year soybean aphids will be a problem. Now, we found soybean aphid in Manitoba for the first time in 2001, and that wasn't a bad year. It was just, it was the first year we found it, but very low levels. Since then, we've had five years where we've had, I'll call them high levels of soybean aphids. So economic populations, um, spraying that was more than just say a couple fields. So a bit more widespread spraying. That happened in five years uh, out of the last uh, 22. Um, we've had two years that had, I'll call them moderate populations. Um, a few fields sprayed, but nothing really widespread. And we've had 15 years where aphid levels were low. And as far as I'm aware, there was no insecticide applications in those years. So it's not a chronic problem. It's not an annual problem. It's something that every now and then we get a population that blows in and is able to establish uncontained to the point where we do have to do some spraying. And so far we haven't had two bad year, a high economic status years back to back. We've always had a break between a bad year and the next bad year. I covered uh, thresholds last year in the soybean industry update. So I'm gonna go over it a bit quicker this year, but just as a reminder that we've, um, we've got some very good research on economic thresholds for soybean aphids. So we're quite confident in, the, uh, in this threshold and the numbers. And one of the numbers that is worth knowing is something called the economic injury level which is a bit different than your economic threshold where we suggest you start spraying. The economic injury level is really the point where the yield that the, the yield loss the aphids are causing equals your control cost. That's your economic injury level. And from this humongous study that was done um, in six states and at 19 different sites, um, they figured out that the economic injury level was about 670 aphids per plant. So very high threshold. But we don't want you waiting till 670 aphids per plant to make a spray decision because if they're not being contained, aphids can reproduce super quick. And then you're looking at economic loss that um, is going to be uh, quite substantial, potentially. So uh, the economic threshold has been set at 250 aphids per plant and that aphid population still increasing towards that 670. If uh, your population is doing what Horst showed with his uh, graph, if it's starting to plateau or decline, you're not gonna hit that economic injury level. You don't need to spray. But if you hit that 250, you go out scout again, it's increased. Um, yeah, then you, you, it'll be economical to control that population. Um, if they're not being contained, they can double their population in about seven days. So uh, something you do need to keep an eye on if you're seeing those high levels. Uh, just to give you an idea of what the damage they can do looks like, um, from that economic threshold study, they used uh, a measure called aphid days. And what an aphid day is, is an aphid day is one aphid feeding on one plant for 24 hours. We call that an aphid day. And one of the uh, numbers out of that study was that the yield was reduced by roughly 7% for every 10,000 aphid days accumulated. So uh, just as an example, if you've got 500 aphids per plant, and they feed for 20 days. That uh, 20 times 500, that equals 10,000 aphid days. And that would cause about a 7% yield loss. So um, that's kind of what you're looking at. Uh, uh, if suppose we, instead of 500, uh, we had uh, 100 uh, aphids per plant for 20 days you're looking at 2,000 aphid days. Uh, your yield loss, there will be some yield loss, but it, it really won't be significant to the point where 
uh, you would need to be doing a foliar spray. Uh, the staging is also critical when it comes to uh, treating soybean aphids. Uh, there's probably no big benefit to spraying during the, the vegetative stages, but once the plants start to bloom, that's when things can become more economical. Uh, the most critical stage to protect is when you've got seeds developing. Um, so from about R1 to R5, that's really the most critical stage that you need to protect. Once you get to R6, the seeds are um, starting to firm up a little bit, they're fully sized, they're firming up, um, then there's less economic benefit. And uh, uh, you, usually at R6, unless it's a very extreme population, you don't need to be spraying. But R1 to R5, those are the stages you need to watch for. And I showed this last year too, just to, uh, reinforce the point that when we talk about scouting soybean aphids, um, you're estimating populations you cannot accurately count. Um, I actually did have my summer student count each aphid on this plant after we took the photo so I could make this diagram, but trying to do this in the field would be impossible. There's no way you could sit and go one, two, three, four and start counting aphids. You have to as a crop scout or a farmer growing soybeans, you have to get good at estimating levels. Uh, that's what you're gonna be doing to make decisions. Um, so this photo here I have in our Manitoba Ag Fact Sheet, so you can use that as a guideline. And there's, there's other things if you um, uh, start looking, there's other guides and things that give you um, some photo keys that'll help you with that estimation. Also, when you're doing your counts, make sure that you are randomly selecting the plants. Don't be um, looking ahead of you for a plant with a lot of aphids to do your estimations on, because uh, then uh, you don't have a proper average of aphids per plant. You have counted aphids on the highest plants, but that's not the average per field. To really have a proper um, count of average aphids per plant, those plants need to be selected randomly. So don't be looking too hard for plants with uh, lots of aphids. Uh, walk in, look up if you have to, grab a plant near you, uh, choose that plant, count the aphids. If it doesn't have a huge number, but you know there's a, a big population, a few plants over, you still count the one that you're working on. That's the one you chose. If you do have an economic population, doing it randomly like that, uh, you will get the counts above the threshold if it's truly economical. And now as far as management options for soybean aphids go, uh, once again, we've got some seed treatments that have soybean aphids on their label, but I don't really talk about those a lot in Manitoba because um, likely those uh, seed treatments are gone by the time soybean aphids are here. So where soybean aphids overwinter and they're present really early, the seed treatments may be helpful in knocking back those early season populations. Here in Manitoba, less likely. So your better strategy, I, I personally, uh, I wouldn't be putting on a seed treatment thinking that you're going to get soybean aphid control here in Manitoba. I wouldn't, that's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be buying a seed treatment for that reason. There's other reasons you might wanna consider your seed treatments. Uh, cutworms might be a factor for some, wireworms, certainly pathogens, but uh, soybean aphid, uh, like I said, it's um, uh, probably less chance of it doing um, any economical benefit for you here in Manitoba. There are foliar sprays that do work quite well, and I'll show you those in just a sec. Um, but also I do note that um, we do have a lot of other things that manage soybean aphids as well. A lot of predators, parasites, and some pathogenic funguses. So uh, when you're thinking of your management strategies, if you're seeing a lot of these things, also be thinking, how can I keep them doing their job for me? So for foliar insecticides, uh, Horst put up a good slide um, uh, showing Safina. Now he had Matador, I believe, in his slide, but Manador is not available in Manitoba this year, but we do have Silencer, La Bamba, Zavada. Those are generic versions. Um, 
these are your options right now for soybean aphids. Uh, I've got a, an asterisk beside three of the products up near the top, Safina, Movento, Savanto Prime. These are your more selective products, meaning they kill aphids, they don't kill much else. So if you do have a lot of natural enemies, uh, say you were out scouting, noted there was a lot of lady beetles and lace wings and um, hoverfly larva, these products will preserve them. Um, Safina is a new herb product. We had trouble getting sufficient quantities in Manitoba last year when we had some soybean aphids. I know some people did use it. Uh, good residual, um, certainly does the job well. Um, availability was the biggest problem last year, but it does work well and it is selective. And it is, um, I'll say, reasonably priced. You'll pay a bit more than you would for one of the pyrethroids, but it's not, um, it's not um, unreasonably priced uh, for a, a selective product. The other two, Movento and Savanto Prime, also selective. These are um, more hort products. So um, they'll, they'll do the job fine, but they are priced more for the hort market. And um, your silent Sir La Bombas, again, that's an, generic versions of Lambda Cyhalothrin. Manador is another version of this, just not available. Um, certainly does the job on aphids, um, cheap. Um, might not be as available this year, depending on how much silent sir and Labamba is around in Zavada. Uh, the other thing to note is there has been documented soybean aphid resistance to the pyrethroids further south and actually even in Manitoba. But what we think happened here is we were getting aphids blowing in that were already resistant to pyrethroids because I, there's no way that we would have had pyrethroid resistance develop here. We just haven't been spraying regularly and routinely for soybean aphids. So, uh, but if we do get soybean aphids blowing in and they're already resistant to pyrethroids, um, that is a group that uh, we'll have to be careful with. So I mentioned about things that regulate soybean aphids and I've um, gone over this in other presentations and just so I don't go way over time, I'm just gonna mention very quickly that we've got um, several predaceous insects that can do a really good job uh, eating soybean aphids. The uh, Insect I'm showing you in the photo here, this is a laden star larva of a species of lady beetle. Uh, this is the um, seven spotted lady beetle larva. And there was a study done at the University of Guelph on this species. And they found that the older juveniles like this one and the adult females can each eat over a hundred aphids per individual per day. So big numbers, the males ate a little bit less. Uh, females have reproductive needs, so they were a bit hungrier and ate a bit more. But even the males were eating uh, quite large numbers of aphids per day. So uh, again, if you're seeing a lot of these beneficials, um, consider that into your decision-making as well. And if you are seeing aphids that look like they're turning a white or pinkish color, like a fuzzy white or pinkish color, uh, that could be a pathogenic fungus getting into the population. Um, spider mites, I'm only going to mention very briefly, they're another, uh, they are a sap feeder, but the way they feed is they puncture a cell, an individual cell, and they drain the juice out of it. So you get these little white spots appearing on your leaves. If you get enough of that, the leaves starts to look really speckled. Uh, over time, it might turn a, a yellowish or a brownish color. Um, often we get very heavy edge effects with this. And um, it's usually much more common in dry years. If you have uh, good moisture, there's fungal pathogens that help keep levels of these mites down. Um, they get washed off of plants easy. So it's usually more dry years when we have spider mite um, problems. I mentioned pyrethroids here uh, in the caution, don't use them for spider mites. They're not registered for spider mites. Uh, dimethoate, Saigon or Lagon is the only thing registered. Uh, even if you can get cheap silencer or something, um, 
Pyrethroids do not work well on spider mites. They work really well on some of the predators of spider mites. So you can actually flare your spider mite population by using a pyrethroid. So uh, use the labeled stuff. Don't be doing off-label cheaper control for spider mites. You could make the situation worse. Um, grasshoppers, I'll cover this uh, maybe in a little bit more detail, but I'll try not to go too much over time here, Dennis, and uh, leave you some time. Um, so on soybeans, uh, grasshoppers, sometimes, and um, some years we frequently see them heavier along field margins. Soybeans are not their favorite crop to feed on, but they will feed on them. So sometimes you do get them moving in from other crops late in the season, and you'll get these edge effects. And so sometimes it's possible just to treat your edges for uh, grasshoppers and soybeans, but we have seen them invade and do severe damage right throughout fields. So that's certainly something you have to keep an eye on. Every year we do do a survey in Manitoba where we go out in August and we count grasshoppers on roadside ditches and field edges and we produce a map based on that survey and then we try to factor in um, natural enemy levels we were seeing, current trends in grasshopper populations, weather conditions, how conducive was the fall for egg laying, and we produce a forecast. So this is the survey map from last year. And we do have a lot of yellow and orange on the map. Anything green is light or risk. When we get into the oranges, that means a bit more moderate risk. We don't have any red on the map, luckily. So for quite a few areas of the province, we're at more of a moderate risk situation. But even areas in green, I would say still consider grasshoppers something to um, have high on your scouting list for next year. Um, because we know that in some of these areas, we did have economic populations. There was grasshopper spraying in all of our agricultural regions last year. So even areas that are green, such as maybe in the east here, um, I would still be looking for grasshoppers next year. Don't let your guard down too much. When we put our map together with the other two prairie provinces, uh, this is what it looks like. Um, things get even a bit uh, worse when we get into central Saskatchewan. Um, but we've had some higher levels for a few years in Manitoba, so good to be uh, scouting for grasshoppers. Um, a positive note regarding grasshopper populations, uh, I was seeing quite a bit of a pathogen of grasshoppers. Uh, it's a fungal pathogen called Entomophagia grilli, and we call the disease that it produces summit disease. And what happens is when the grasshoppers get infected by spores of this fungus, they climb the plants and they cling on really tightly to the uh, top of the plants and they end up dying that way. And so when you walk into a field, you've got all these dead grasshoppers clinging to the top of the plants. And they're not just hanging there, they're actually clinging on. So you'd have to work to remove them. Um, I saw higher levels of this last year than I have in many previous years. So that's a good sign. And that might be because of the very wet, damp conditions we had earlier last summer. Uh, this, the fungal spores, um, survive better and infect more grasshoppers when we have some extended periods of uh, damp, humid weather. So that's what I think kind of got this going in the population last year. And uh, I was seeing a bit more of it than I normally do. So that might help somewhat in some areas. I was also seeing higher levels of a few grasshopper egg predators last year. Um, so on the upper left in the photo here, is a cluster of grasshopper eggs. Each individual egg looks like a grain of brown rice, but you never see just one. They're, when grasshoppers lay eggs, they're in a what we call an egg pod. So you've got 20, 30, maybe even more eggs packed tightly together in this pod. Um, there's a, uh, several insects that like to feed on nothing but grasshopper eggs. And one that I was seeing a lot of last year was a species of fly, they're called bee flies, almost looks like a bumblebee, a tiny bumblebee. Uh, but this species here is called the grasshopper bee fly. 
its larva eats nothing but grasshopper eggs. So um, the female fly will note where a grasshopper is laying its eggs, go place its eggs right next to the grasshopper eggs. When the uh, bee fly eggs hatch, their larva make a bee line right for the, uh, excuse the pun there, right for the grasshopper eggs and uh, spend their entire life feeding on the grasshopper eggs. Um, and I was seeing a lot of bee flies last year. Blister beetles, um, there's a few species of blister beetles where same thing, the larvae feed on nothing but grasshopper eggs. Uh, so the ones that you would have been seeing potentially even in soybeans would be the black blister beetle and a grayer one called the ash gray blister beetle. Both of those species, the larvae feed on nothing but grasshopper eggs. The metallic purple and green one has different food habits, but if it's a black or a gray blister beetle, um, they're, uh, when they're young, they're feeding on your grasshopper eggs. Um, and just as a side note, some years when we have a lot of grasshoppers around, you will start seeing a lot of these blister beetles, even in your soybeans. I did get a call last year from somebody worried, are these blister beetles gonna be um, doing enough damage that I should be worried about spraying them? Now, when I uh, got talking with the agronomist, he noted that they were very patchy in the field, which is often the case. And I'm gonna maybe conclude uh, later by showing you that soybeans can take a lot of defoliation before things get economical. Um, so some blister beetles in the field uh, is not gonna be an economical concern and they do have that good side that they do feed on the grasshopper eggs. I put the field cricket picture in here. Uh, I don't wanna get into it in too much detail, but they're omnivores. Um, aside from weed seeds, some plant material, they will feed on um, grasshopper eggs as well. So they do have a good side to them. Um, winter temperatures in grasshoppers, it needs to get to about minus 15 where the eggs are in the soil to kill the grasshopper eggs doesn't usually occur anywhere where there's lots of snow, there's going to be enough insulation, you will get good egg survival. So uh, based on this winter, don't expect much winter kill for the egg masses. And uh, when we get into spring and the ditches are full of water and uh, you may have water that's pooled in some of your fields, people will start wondering, hmm, is that going to be killing and drowning the grasshopper eggs? The short answer is no. The grasshopper eggs have a waterproof coating on their eggshell. It's called a corian. Um, it makes them basically uh, resistant to excess water. Uh, a colleague of mine once took a bunch of grasshopper eggs, put them in a glass of water for a week, dumped the water out, the eggs hatched. So those early rains we get in April and May, they won't do much to the grasshopper population rains we get after the eggs hatch and their young nips could have significant effects on the population. It's um, those rains in June that in some years can really knock that population back. Not that you want a lot of rain in June. And the other question I get from people occasionally is if we burn our ditches, are we killing the grasshopper eggs? Short answer is no. Um, this study that I'm citing here was done in North Dakota. They burnt ditches, they dug up grasshopper eggs. They found there was a few species that lay their eggs right at the surface of the soil that some of the eggs were getting killed. But for our pest species, their eggs are all deep enough that um, they were surviving the burn. So there might be other reasons why or why not you want to be burning, but you won't be killing grasshopper eggs. I'm gonna maybe skip over thistle caterpillar because I know I'm probably running short of time. Uh, I've got two more things I want to show though. Um, defoliation in soybeans. Soybeans can take a lot of defoliation before uh, you get significant yield loss, especially if there's decent soil moisture. And a study done in the US, they found that at 40% leaf loss at any of the vegetative stages, it, there was a roughly a three to 7% yield reduction. Now. On my chart here, we don't even have 40%. Our highest category here is 30%, which probably looks horrible to a lot of people. Um, and some insects like thistle caterpillar will defoliate 
more the upper than the lower leaves. So my caution is if you're scouting defoliation in soybeans, do note that it takes a lot of foliation, um, usually more than about 30% in the vegetative stages to do economic damage. Um, and things, uh, things could be tricky uh, estimating accurate levels as well, because uh, something like 20% or 30% can actually look pretty horrible. And maybe I'll just summarize this super quickly. Soybeans are really good at compensating for defoliation. They produce excess leaves. They will retain older leaves longer when you get some defoliation. Um, and they will produce additional growth and branching um, to compensate for defoliation. So um, again, uh, don't get over panicky if you start seeing a bit of defoliation on the plants. They can take a lot. But what I do want to show, just to maybe wrap things up here, is um, there's been a lot of talk controversy regarding Matador not being available this year. What happened there, um, that was a company decision. The um, product, Lambda Sihalothrin, that's the active ingredient in Matador Silencer, uh, that went under review. And a few things were removed from the label. So sunflowers was removed, pastures, a few vegetable crops. Soybeans is still on the label, canola, flax, corn, a lot of your field crops. But um, there was an amendment put on the label that those crops can't be used as animal feed should you spray uh, Lambda Sahelothrin. That's what's caused the controversy. Um, if you are going to use it on your soybeans, you have to be sure that the soybeans aren't going to be used in any way for animal feed later on. So because of that, um, companies have been deciding how they're going to market the product this year. Syngenta decided they're not going to be marketing Matador or Volium Express in Western Canada this year. Uh, Adama will be selling Silencer and Zavada and uh, Sharda will have some La Bamba. So you'll get some of the, um, the generic brands still available. You won't be finding the Matador. So that's really what's happened with uh, those products. So just to summarize, cutworm populations can be patchy, still one to watch for. Um, thresholds for soybean aphids are quite high, another one to watch for. And soybeans are really good at compensating for defoliation. So I'll end with that. And um, Dennis, I don't know if we want questions now or just wait till the end. Yeah, no, I think uh, I've, uh, there's no questions in the, in the box right now. Um, but uh, <clears throat> just a couple things just to let, you, let everybody know. What we're going to do is uh, the, these presentations have been recorded. And uh, I'm also going to ask the presenters to send me a PDF of their presentation and we'll attach that to the email as well so anybody who's looking for that slide set they can, will have access to it so that's good that's good um so i have a couple of slides or you know, probably about 10 slides i'd like to go through quickly on phytophthora and uh, also on scn um what i'd like to do also is uh, open it up at the end as well and uh um what i'll ask everybody to do is if you have any questions that you'd like to ask um, just uh, raise your hand and um, then I can unmute you from this end here. So we're just going to get to this uh, slideshow mode here. Just give me a second. Here we go. <clears throat> so um, moving into the last talk here, uh, just a few things I wanted to talk about here today uh, with respect to soybean acres. Um, this is something I try to present every year um, because there's always interest from the industry. So in 2022, we had about 815,000 acres of commercial production, and then there's probably another 70 or 75,000 acres of seed production. Uh, of that uh, 815,000 acres, um, we are looking at about 1.8% uh, of those acres are considered conventional um, soybeans. And uh, the other interesting part of that is uh, the Ben Run seed uh, you know, discussion every year that we see here is uh, quite interesting as well. Um, what we're looking at here is uh, about 5% of the acres this past year, about 40,000 acres, uh, is what we had as a bin run seed according to MESC. And compared to uh, 
uh, compared to previous years in 2021, where we had about 8.4%, which represented about 101,000 acres, and uh, about 10% in 2020, so about 100,000 acres there. So we did def we did definitely see a drop in, in bin run seed acres. Um, this one, this slide you saw before, um, again, you can see the trends of uh, the soybean acres. We had our big year in 2017. Then we had our dry years and we saw the yields drop as well as the acres drop. Uh, this year, we broke a provincial record at 45 bushels an acre when you round up. Um, and that's the highest that we've ever seen in the province. So I think just everything kind of fell into place with the, in that respect. Um, and, you know, we had a little later seeding. Um, the soybean went into the ground relatively quickly. And uh, they came out of the ground really, really quick as well. We didn't have a lot of stress through the growing season and we had a nice long growing season. So it was, we were able to hit those, those magic numbers of, of, you know, there's reports of the highest I've heard that were actually weighed in was 80 bushels an acre. Um, that was pretty, uh, that was pretty impressive. So um, again, it's not necessarily the whole, the whole, the whole province, but the numbers were quite, uh, quite good this year. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about here today is on uh, phytophthora root rot, and um, I'm just going to get rid of my picture here, stop my video and just share the screen. Okay, um, so phytophthora root rot is a disease that's specific to so soybeans and can affect at any growth stage. It's basically a water mold favored by warm, wet conditions, and it's most likely to, uh, 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 likely to occur in the drains and low-lying areas as you can see kind of in, the, in this middle picture here. Uh, and it is something that, uh, that uh, we have seen from time to time in Manitoba. Uh, this year, later in the season, we saw it a little bit more pronounced uh, in the field uh, later in the season. We didn't see much early on. Um, with the top root rot symptoms, you can have yellow welted or dead plants with the leaves still attached. That's what the uh, interesting part about that is the leaves that hang on the plant. Uh, the chocolate brown lesions on the stem that extend upwards from the soil line um, and there's also discoloration in the, ins in the uh, uh, inside the stem as well as stunted roots. Um, one of the distinguishing factors between uh, northern stem canker and uh, phytophthora root rot is when you pull out a plant that is, is phytophthora root rot, uh, those, those plants pull out quite easily um, and the roots are pretty much gone. Whereas northern stem canker, it's much more difficult to pull those roots out. Um, some, of the, some of the work that uh, Mental Pulse Growers did this past summer um, with uh, the EOS lab in, uh, in Ontario is um, um, they uh, did pull some soil samples. So, so this particular chart here shows you what the current uh, resistant genes are that you'll find in the seed guide. Those are your major gene resistance. So 1A, 1C, 1K, 3A, and 6. Um, here are our, our pathotypes. We even have a new pathotype that hasn't been named yet. But you can he see here which ones of the, if these uh, resistant genes are susceptible and resistant to each of the different pathotypes here. So um, right now, RAY6 is the one that's, that is resistant to all the types that we have here. Um, 1A is susceptible to everything. So um, that is something that's uh, um, that, just something to view here. Um, so part of this, the work that was done this past year in 2022, there were 11 field sample through central Manitoba. Those were sent off to AOS uh, Technologies and they analyzed that soil. And uh, what this particular chart shows here, um, so here are your resistant genes and uh, here are the percent of the fields where the uh, RSP genes were defeated. So 1A, 100%, uh, 1C, 100%, um, um, uh, rate 6, uh, 27%, and 3A at 64%. So um, the we do have you know, soybean resistant genes, but based on this particular 11 fields that they surveyed here, you can see which one, which of the races are, uh, are still working, working well. Um, the other discussion that's come up over the years and is field tolerance or, or minor gene resistance. Um, it's generally express, expressed after the unifoliate, straight, uh, unifoliate stage and is controlled by multi, multiple minor genes. So it, the nice thing about you know varieties that have field tolerance is it's not relying on those ma major genes and basically the plant kind of gets sick but kind of grows through it. But there's always been some uh, challenges, I guess, with trying to present this information in the seed guide because a number of the companies that sell soybean seed have have um, resist uh, field tolerance ratings for their varieties, but the scales from one company to another can vary. So one can be a one to nine and one can be a one to five. Um, and sometimes a one to nine can be 
one being the most tolerant, nine being most susceptible, whereas another company might do it in reverse. So we want to try to come up with a, uh, a test so we could actually look at and see um, what field tolerance could be like. So the same AOS Technologies Lab has developed a hydroponic uh, field tolerance test that is based on seed. And uh, so last year we did a pilot project and uh, the samples that uh, were sent uh, were or were from uh, the uh, seed supplies from last year's trials in, in the spring. Um, and uh, 12 companies or 12 lines were, uh, were tested. Uh, typically what happens is the, uh, once the seed is received uh, by the lab, it's, it's seeded into the vermiculites um, and then uh, it's uh, grown out and then that seedlings are transferred into the hydroponic system. system. Uh, it's inoculated with a PSOJ mixture, which basically kind of takes care of any major gene resistance. So whatever is left is your minor gene resistance. And then, uh, you know, uh, you know, about a month later, they evaluate the plants and see what, uh, what kind of growth they have. Now, these are the um, phenotypic responses of the reference varieties or the check varieties. So their susceptible variety is the class five variety harrow. You can see here, those plants are pretty much dead. The roots are dead, um, not very healthy whatsoever. The highly tolerant reference is S14A6, your class one. Uh, with that variety there, very healthy plants, uh, no issues whatsoever. And then we have the class three, which is Conrad. Um, and they, um, these are mild, mildly tolerant reference checks. So what happens with the varieties from last year with the 12 lines? Well, they grew those out. And um, what they came back with with those 12 lines is uh, the class one. We had one variety that was in the class one or highly tolerant, normal growth with dense uh, root volume and white roots without any symptoms to the uh, highly susceptible, which is mortality greater than 40%. Uh, fortunately, there were no varieties that fell into that category. Uh, class three was the most predominant uh, type that we had. Uh, the growth was affected, but root, volumes, uh, root volume was reduced and there was some root symptoms, but still fairly tolerant yet. Um, and then there was, uh, we had one that was in the susceptible category, one variety here, uh, where the growth was strongly affected. And the whole idea behind this study is we've been trying to find a way of being able to present this data in the seed guide. So this year, uh, what's, been, what's happening is companies are given the option to enter their lines into the variety trials and into this particular phytophthora root rot resistance field tolerance test. So next year, the hope is to have this information available for growers. Um, and this, these are the results from last year's uh, pilot project. The next thing I'd like to uh, kind of kind of move into here quickly here before we open it up is uh, soybean cyst uh, uh, nematode. And I just kind of give everybody a quick update to what we're finding here. Uh, we have five confirmed RMs now that have um, soybean cyst nematode in Manitoba. Uh, the most recent one is the arm of Thompson right down here. Um, the interesting thing with these five RMs, the only RM so far that we've actually found it on symptoms, you know, above ground symptoms and found cysts on the roots has been in this last most recent find back in 2021 in the arm of Thompson. Up until then, any of the other uh, studies uh, that Miro Chinud has done, he's only found soybean cyst nematode by digging through the soil and, and under the microscope. So, you know, it's not severe yet in Manitoba. However, the field that, uh, uh, that we did find in 2021, I'm just gonna go ahead and slide here. Um, this is what I was called out to. Um, and what you can see here, it kind of looks like uh, IDC symptoms in the, in the field, but the unfortunate part is that these IDC symptoms never did dissipate throughout the growing season. And uh, this is in mid-July when they called us out. And you can see here a nice healthy row along the outer edge of the field. And uh, you can see these plants here are quite severely affected. And at first glance, you might, you might think SCN. Um, however, what ends up happening is when you actually dig those plants up, this is what you find. Uh, you find these small little cysts on here. And, and you can see here where some of the nodules are here on the, uh, on the uh, my laser pointer up, on the, on the soybean root here. But you can see all these little cysts that are on here. And that was pretty... That's pretty uh, interesting to actually see that uh, in the field that dramatically. It's the first time I think uh, even when Mario came out to uh, look at the field, he was quite excited to actually find some there initially. And then when he saw how severe it was, his head just went down. He's like, I, I wouldn't have expected this to see at the at these high levels uh, without seeing any symptoms in previous years. Um, and uh, so it was quite interesting with this field here. I lost my mouse here. Here we go, I'll try that again. 
and we'll just get rid of this here. And we're going to go back a couple of slides here because what they ended up, one of the one of the companies ended up doing was um, they actually grid sample this entire field here. And um, it was quite interesting here along the roadway here is where it was most severe. And uh, but when they soil sample the whole field, uh, you can see here all these little hot spots within the field. So it was definitely there. And uh, but again, it was most predominant around the edge of the field. So this grower is, is, is looking at a few different things. In this particular instance, this field was uh, soybeans one in four years, but there was also dry beans mixed into that rotation as well. So dry beans provide a host year for soybean cyst nematode. And for any dry bean gro uh, uh, growers out there and any industry folks that work with them, um, you know, if you're seeing some symptoms in the, in the dry bean field that look a little, little off, you know, maybe extreme IDC, stunted plants, those types of things, maybe examine the roots. Um, they have, especially if you're looking at kidney beans, um, this in North Dakota, in Minnesota, actually about five, six years ago, they found a field that was actually quite severely affected, a kidney bean field with soybean cyst nematode. So because it provides a host year, um, you know, if you have soybeans and dry beans in the same rotation, that can be a bit of a concern. Um, you know, in this field, there was, there was some equipment moved in from SCN areas as well. So if you do bring equipment in from other areas, please, you know, uh, make sure that equipment is clean, clean off all the soil because soybean system total moves in through soil particles. Uh, this was also along a creek as well with a lot of birds and, and geese that flew in. So potentially there could be a risk of contamination there as well. And uh, this, to, to end it all off, this variety did not have any soybean system uh, tolerance in, as well, or resistance, I guess I, sh I should say. Um, so that's what I would recommend for anybody growing uh, uh, soybeans moving forward. If they have fields that maybe have a little long, tighter rotation or longer history of soybeans, making sure that uh, you have some soybean cyst nematode genetics in your, in your uh, portfolio. Uh, right now, of the, I've, I did this survey a couple of years ago. Of the 1.2 million acres we had two years ago, there was around 300,000 acres that were soybean cyst nematode that were grown in Manitoba. So um, there is definitely some options uh, moving forward if you want to look at uh, look at some of these varieties moving forward. So um, again, just under the microscope, you can kind of see here the, the lemon-shaped cysts here compared to your nodule. And again, here are some of your uh, host plants uh, in other crops. And you can see here that uh, things like, uh, you know, uh, lupins, uh, soybeans, peas, all provide another host here. There are also some uh, common wheat species as well here that, uh, that do have that in there too. So, so with that, I'm going to ask uh, that, um, <clears throat> that we uh, just stop the recording at present. And